When Kathleen Mangan found a creepy message from her estranged husband on his computer, she contacted the authorities. Gilberto Valley, at the time a 28-year-old New York City police officer, would be arrested after the FBI investigated the internet messages and found explicit plots to abduct, torture, cook, and eat women. Valley's internet transcripts would be read aloud in court and they were like something out of a horror movie. Valley wrote about wanting to consume girl meat for Thanksgiving dinner on the website Dark Fetish Network. And he wrote so much worse than that. According to authorities, Valley detailed a particular method of cooking a victim slowly while trying to keep her alive as long as possible and described how tasty a woman would look with her legs bent up inside an oven as she was roasted alive. He sent this and much more, tales of real people. He expressed wanting to kidnap, torture, and rape to fellow Dark Fetish Network users with handles like Moody Blues and Meat Market Man. Moody Blues talked about even darker fantasies, like eating a five-year-old. Truly horrific, despicable shit. Gill would be arrested, and within a year, he'd be found guilty of improperly using a police database and conspiracy to commit kidnapping. Almost all the evidence against him came from transcripts of online private conversations where Gill chatted often and at length about kidnapping and consuming women. These chat room conversations, like many of Gill's actions, were certainly abhorrent, but they actually constitute a crime. He didn't ever kill anyone, nor did he buy any of the items he would need to do so, like restraints, weapons, or a tarp, even though he had plans detailed how he'd like to set this equipment up. According to Gill, he just put his deviant fantasies online like many, many other innocent people do. But is that all this was? Or as his prosecution claimed, Was he planning a real-life kidnapping? Was this all less fantasy and more strategy? Were authorities supposed to stand by until he actually killed and ate someone, giving them proof he was as deviant as they suspected? The steps Gil took to carry out the plan to kidnap and eat women certainly amounted to a truly stunning abuse of authority and invasion of privacy. He used the records available to him to make a database of potential victims. He tracked down real women, many of whom he knew. And Gill's database wasn't limited to merely their names, but also physical descriptions and photographs of these women, which he shared with other cannibalism enthusiasts online, other users who also talked in great detail about how they wanted to rape, torture, kill, and eat these women. Sure seems like even if he wasn't really going to kidnap and kill them, he was putting their lives in danger by sending their photos and names and physical descriptions to other people who might not just have been fantasizing. One of these women was a new mother and his own wife. Gil talked a lot about his wife, about how much pleasure he'd taken kidnapping her, slowly cooking her to death, raping and eating her. When the news of all this hit the tabloids, it was certainly a deeply disgusting story that made for a lot of juicy front page news. A police officer sworn to protect and serve using government databases to compile a list of potential kidnapping, rape, torture and cannibalism, cannibalism victims, right? Cannibal cop, certainly an attention grabbing headline. But again, did these very dark sexual fantasies of Gilbert Valley constitute crimes tantamount to planning to do what he fantasized about doing in real life. When it comes to actual criminal monitoring, apprehension, and prosecution, where should the line between fantasy and reality lie? When should you be able to say that someone has crossed over that line from mere role-playing to making a real plan to harm real people? The confusing, deeply disturbing case of Gilbert Valley, the cannibal cop, right here, right now, on this horrifying Halloween edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday and happy Halloween, Meat Sacks. Halloween on a Monday. Kind of lame. Hope you had some uh, Halloween fun over this past weekend, at least. And, uh, you know, hope you have fun uh, if you're hearing this when it comes out on Monday tonight as well. Taking the kitties out, maybe. Hope you've been enjoying the horror podcast uh, that I co-host with the Queen of the Sucks, Scared to Death, right? It's been extra fun to be spooky this October. It's the season for it. I'm Dan Cummins, Spooky Sucker, the Master Sucker, Count Succula. And you are listening to Time Suck. Uh, heard a lot of you initially thought last week's episode was titled The Bloody Herpes instead of The Bloody Harpies or Bloody Harps. I want to say harpies too when I read it. Uh, What a very different topic that would have been. Uh, Experiment with a sound bed in the cold open last week. If you really preferred it that way, well, you know, let us uh, let us know if you feel like it really adds to the show. Maybe we'll make that more of a regular thing. Hoping my uh, hoping my mush mouth is under control today. Man, I I think we we uh, normally don't record the cold open uh, more than once. I try to get that one right, and we'll stop down and re-record. I think I just did that about eleven or twelve times. My brain was just not reading notes. 
<laughs> not so many thoughts. I was up late. I added so much to this episode at the last minute. I was like, no, I got to talk about this. I got to talk about this. It was all jumbled in my head as I was trying to start the show. But hopefully it's under control now. Uh, because Halloween, this week's merch piece is the Deadly White Zombie Tea. May her legacy literally never die. May her legacy be undead. Head on over to badmagicmerch.com to check out what a zombified Betty White looks like. Uh, I did have fun, as I'd hoped, when I uh, recorded last week's show in Grand Rapids and Holland, Michigan, this uh, this past weekend. Well, for me, this past weekend, it'll be two weekends back when you hear this. Uh, Holland, not New Holland. I don't know why I kept saying New Holland. Probably because there's a brewery there, New Holland Brewery, that I love. Uh, but had some had some fun with the fine uh, disciples of the good God, Amway. So thanks to everyone who came out. And then um, this week, well, this week I won't be anywhere. I'm hoping I'll, I'll hope to have fun in Austin, Texas. When this comes out, the past weekend, and then it's uh, Louisville, Kentucky, then Portland, Oregon, and finally Minneapolis to wrap up uh, this year's shows. DanCummins.tv for ticks and ticks for the 2023 spring dates, also at DanCummins.tv. And now we go back to the realm of true crime, but with a twist. Today's case is not very similar to any of the other cases we've covered here on Time Suck that I can think of. In the vast majority of the true crime cases we've covered, there's been, well, a victim, obviously. Uh, most of the time, multiple victims. There's brutalized bodies, almost unimaginable real-world horror inflicted upon innocent victims. There are families desperately searching for their missing family members or wonder what kind of monster killed their loved ones when the bodies are found. None of that would go down in the cannibal cop case. Gil never actually kidnapped, tortured, raped, cooked, killed, uh, ate anyone. But was he planning on doing that? Was he planning on doing a whole fucking bunch of that shit uh, with a bunch of other people that were also planning on doing a lot of that stuff? Stuff that they were writing about in great detail. Was he planning on enlisting the services of someone like, uh, say, my dad to help him kidnap and kill anyone? Does my dad have a subscription and a profile on darkfetishnetwork.com? Does my dad work as an admin on darkfetishnetwork.com? Does my dad own Dark Fetish Network? Did he design it? Is he cooking up some, uh, some lady meat right now? Where is he? I'm trying to talk too much about him today. It just bothers me not knowing where he is. Back to Gill, if the cops and the FBI hadn't have acted when they did, would there be a body? Would there be a lot of bodies that would have been found later? A lot to think about today. Right, as I just said, Gill Valley didn't technically kill, eat anyone. Nor did he do anything he'd need to do to prepare for those things like buying special equipment. But he did track his potential victims' daily activities. Right, and that's pretty uh, disturbing considering what he was writing about. He did use a database to find one of his potential victims' home addresses. He did share photos of women he talked about wanting to kill online. He talked to his virtual buddies about how much he wanted to eat these women online. But does that actually uh, constitute a, a plot to kidnap someone for real? Where do you draw the line? That's the big question with today's episode. Is, is a plot to kidnap started when the person buys uh, zip ties? Or when they get in their car to drive to their potential victim's house? Does it not technically start until they're about to knock on their victim's door? Or does it not start until they actually grab some terrified person and try to take them somewhere against their will? Where is the line between planning and uh, fantasizing, right? Uh, to, to kidnap somebody or any other major crime. The line between criminal thoughts and action is something that the courts have been pondering for decades in the United States. Thoughts have not always been protected from prosecution here. Laws such as the Sedition Act of 1918 criminalized many forms of speech. The Sedition Act criminalized any disloyal language, whether printed or spoken, about the government of the United States. In April of 1918, the government arrested industrialist William C. Edinborn, a naturalized citizen from Germany, at his railroad business in New Orleans, Louisiana. He was accused of speaking disloyally when he allegedly belittled the threat of Germany to the security of the United States. He thought that Germany wasn't as big of a threat to U.S. security, and he was arrested for thinking that and expressing that thought out loud and taken to jail. He was released. Uh, Mary Ecke would not be released, though. Mary Ecke was a medical doctor devoted to providing care for working class and poor patients. She regularly provided birth control information and abortions at a time when both were illegal. Also served over a year in prison for saying that she thought that a preparedness campaign promoted by the U.S. government to get young men ready to go fight in Europe before being drafted in World War I helped J.P. Morgan and company executives more than the working man. She thought that the working man would be sent to war to die and that J.P. Morgan's execs would not and would rather increase their wealth off of war profiteering. And she served over a year in San Quentin. 
for just vocally disagreeing with U.S. foreign policy in a public place, for expressing thoughts. I mean, what a crock of shit. How is that the land of the free? Thoughts sent people to prison here in the U.S. and not that long ago. American politicians passed laws to punish thoughts. Fellow Americans voted for those politicians, approved of those politicians. Happened a century ago, could easily happen again. Also, there was a time just a little more than a century ago when actually attempting crimes, in many instances, crimes like theft and even murder and kidnapping, were not considered criminal activity. It's not been consistent. Uh, Like if you tried to pick someone's pocket and there was no money in the pocket at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, you couldn't be prosecuted. (laughs) How fucking insane is that? Officer, arrest that man. He just tried to pickpocket me. And what did he take? Nothing, officer. I was able to beat the ruffian away before he managed to take my wallet. So uh, what's the problem? He tried to rob me. Yeah, but he he didn't rob you, did he? Now I just picture the cop taking out his billy club and just like rearing it back like he's about to fucking smack this guy who almost got mugged. Uh, Stop it. What are you doing? Nothing. I just like to hold my billy club like this. You're intimidating me. You look like you're going to strike me at any moment. Yeah, I'm certainly thinking about it. As is my right. If I bash you in the skull, if, then you have reason to try and have me arrested on brutality charges. Now imagine that cop trying to smack this guy, but he keeps dodging the blows. Help! Someone arrest this cop! He's mad! He's assaulting me! I have not committed a crime, sir! I'm not assaulting you! I am trying to assault you! Not a crime! Until I get a good whopping, and I'm going to make it count. When attempted crimes first became criminalized in the U.S. in the early 1900s, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes urged caution, asserting that for the defendant to be convicted... There must be dangerous proximity to success. That standard then weakened in the 1960s when a new set of guidelines guidelines called the Model Penal Code, a successful effort by the legal community to standardize the criminal code across the nation after decades of inconsistent law, uh, replaced the idea of proximity with that of uh, substantial step. As violent crime became a more common reality, the police could now use a suspect's state of mind to justify an arrest, as long as that suspect also took at least some real action, a substantial step towards committing a crime. Now, if you just talk to a friend at the bar about kidnapping some girl who lives across the street, you'd still be a fucking creep, but you wouldn't able to be uh, you wouldn't be able to be arrested. But if you talked about kidnapping some girl who lives across the street, and then you went to the hardware store and bought zip ties, chloroform, a ski mask, some gloves, and then you started to approach that girl in your van that contained these items. Well, now you could be arrested for attempted kidnapping. You've taken substantial steps towards committing that crime. What's changed in recent years are the tools used to detect people taking substantial steps uh, or intent, right? People's online activity. A law professor at Pace University named Audrey Rogers put it this way. We've always said you can't punish for thoughts alone, but now we really know what the thoughts are, right? People prior to the internet, uh, people generally did not share their thoughts in such a provable way, certainly not in a way that left such clear, documentable evidence of these thoughts, as opposed to the he said, she said of a private conversation. Since 9-11, the government has used the monitoring of our new world of constant electric, uh, electronic, excuse me, communication to bring more than 200 prosecutions against people suspected of providing material support to terrorist organizations. In many of these cases, the jury has had to grapple with deciding if the people on trial were just thinking about helping terrorist organizations or planning to help them. Adding to this is the scale of some recent crimes like uh, Columbine or Aurora, Sandy Hook, uh, how people think the technology has the capacity to stop someone murderers before they put murderers' plans into action. In 2009, the FBI was reading Afghan-American uh, Najibullah uh, Zazi's emails to Al-Qaeda and picked him up before he ever built a fully workable bomb. He'd serve a decade in prison for working on a bomb that he may have decided to detonate. And, uh, you know, how do you continue with his plan? Might sound justified, but now put yourself in a similar type situation. What if you thought about killing someone and you went out and you bought a gun to kill that person with? But then after you bought that gun, after you had told some people that you did want to kill this person, that you were going to kill him, you changed your mind. You came to your senses and you decided not to go through with it. If you were still arrested for attempted murder based on someone you'd spoken to previously about wanting to kill this person going to the authorities, would your arrest seem justified or would you essentially have been arrested for committing nothing more than a thought crime? How many of us have thought about committing certain crimes, even taken some initial steps towards committing these crimes, but then changed our minds and not done anything to anyone? 
In late 2013 in Arizona, police traced threatening emails to a 15-year-old who turned out to own 100 rounds of ammunition. He was arrested, even though he didn't actually own a gun. After his arrest, police justified apprehending him, saying that they had learned he'd also researched how to make an explosive device, even though he was unable to procure the parts he would need to make that device. All he actually did was illegally procure ammunition and try to buy parts to make a bomb, yet that wasn't what he was arrested for. He did send threatening emails. Yes, uh, he was arrested for attempting to commit a major crime, attempting to kill many people. But what if he changed his mind after ordering the parts? What what if he never procured uh, a gun ever had he not been arrested? In all these cases, the police said that they had physical evidence, like the bullets in that uh, last example, aside from the emails, to back up arrests. With the cannibal cop case, however, the evidence is more ambiguous, difficult to interpret, and a verdict either way might represent a dismal, uh, a dismal future, right? Either Gil goes free, no one gets prosecuted for thought crimes, but now maybe a real cannibal's on the loose who later kidnaps, rapes, tortures, cooks, and eats some poor woman or women. Or Gil is put in prison for expressing nothing more than fantasies on the internet, paving the way for anyone who's interested in thinking about uh, or jerking off to some fucked up thoughts to be labeled a criminal, to be able to be put in prison. Uh, spoiler alert, both will happen in a way. Gil will first be found guilty, but then on appeal have his sentence reversed. In order to follow this complicated saga today, we're first going to look at cannibalism, including some of the many cultures from every continent on earth that have practiced it in various forms throughout human history. We'll go over some instances of modern cannibalism, talk about what people say human meat tastes like and why people might be into cannibalism in a sexual way. We'll also talk about an, an interesting case of, uh, of so-called ethical cannibalism. When a German man contacted another man over the internet and both agreed that they would, uh, you know, engage in some cannibalism, that the second man would be eaten together, as in the one guy eats the other guy and that guy also eats a bit of himself. Uh, that ethical argument did not really hold up well in court. Finally, we'll follow Gil Valley in today's twisted fetish website, Time Suck Timeline, and explore the many difficulties with this case. And, I'll, and by the way, um, uh, you, if you watch enough videos, sometimes uh, you, he'll see his or hear his name pronounced like Vayai or Vaye. Uh, Gil himself pronounces it Valley. So that's why I'm going with that. So let's eat. I mean, begin. Uh, we've covered cannibalism a bunch before. Some notable Time Suck alumni have been pretty into it. To start, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, subject of episode 36, murdered and ate numerous men in Milwaukee before he was caught and eventually killed in prison. Uh, Albert Fish, Suck subject of episode 141 cannibalized some of his victims and ate, you know, other stuff from his victims. Well, peanut butter, butter and popping out apple cider, showbiz. That's how you do it in Hollywood. German serial killer called Denki, a suck subject of episode 245, sold the cooked parts of around 40 victims. Sold a lot of their meat as pickled pork at a village market. Uh, another German serial killer, Joachim Kroll, suck subject of episode 197, that sexy cow lava. He was cooking up some of the meat from his most recent victim when he was arrested, like that shit was still on the stove. Uh, Andre Chikatilo, suck subject 57, Mr. Uh, what is big deal? I like to wrestle. I like to jerk so shame cock and corn them, bother no one. He admitted to shit like swallowing the nipples he'd bitten off of some of his victims, right? Technically cannibalism. Arthur Genesee River killer Shawcross, a uh, man of so many fucking head wounds, uh, suck subject of episode 281, talked about eating parts of some of his victims, like their vaginas. Richard Chase, I always forget how disturbing that episode was, the vampire of Sacramento, suck subject 207, blended up the organs and blood of some of his victims, and uh, one of the world's most fucked up protein shakes, committed other disgusting bloody acts of cannibalism. Hammer happy sadist Peter Curtin, vampire of Dusseldorf, suck subject of episode 253, also said to have engaged in cannibalism. Uh, the Ripper Crew Devil, subject, uh, subjects of episode 299, ate the breasts of victims, breasts served with some uh, semen gravy. General Butt Naked, suck subject of episode 222, talked about eating the hearts of people he killed in battle to gain their fucking power. Admitted to drinking the blood of children he'd sacrificed to gain favor from gods he felt would make him more, uh, you know, threatening in battle. He was doing this shit in Liberia in the late 1990s. We talked about cannibalism at, at length in the Donner Party Suck, episode 94, and in the recent Alive, the 1972 Aunt Andy's Flight Disaster Suck, episode 302. Even touched on cannibalism when we got into the dark history a Jameson whiskey, an incident of a descendant of James Jameson allegedly engaging in some cannibalism or maybe just witnessing it. And who knows? I might be forgetting more cannibalism we've touched on. 
Why do we seem to talk about cannibalism so much? Like so much. Because I fucking eat people, okay? It satisfies my actual uh, need calories to stay alive hunger and my sexual rock hard boner when I see your sweet ass stuck in an oven set to broil hunger. All right, I like it. If I had things my way, I'd roast up every single one of you tasty ass meat sacks. Hot damn, I'd love to fucking bake you beautiful bastards in an oven after taking off all your clothes and basing your genitals with some melted butter. Mmm, mmm. But seriously, uh, why does it come up so much? Well, cannibalism holds a lot of fascination for a lot of people because it's one of the most taboo things you can do. Comes up a lot here because when it comes to true crime, I do gravitate towards, uh, you know, finding dirtbags who committed the most depraved acts imaginable. And cannibalism, considered by many to be one of those most depraved acts. Now, there's a dark fascination with cannibalism, a strong morbid curiosity, because it's something that very few of us, hopefully very, very few of us will ever experience. But if we were to experience it, What would a person say tastes like? Well, human flesh falls into the category of red meat and by most accounts has the consistency of beef, really tender beef like veal. But the taste is much more subtle than beef, according to anecdotes from humans who've actually dined on human flesh. Those who've eaten people say that human flesh tastes like pork. They may be a little more bitter, a little stronger than actual pork. Mm, All this quality meat talk really getting me hungry. Wish I had one of you on a spit here in the suck dungeon just out of view of these cameras. All right, just so I can enjoy a nice meal. Look forward to a reward for finishing this podcast. Uh, let's talk about some people who are not kidding when they say things like that now. Uh, in 1981, a Japanese man, a sick fuck named Issei Sagawa, nicknamed the Kobe Cannibal, a to 25-year-old female Dutch student, Rene Hartfelt, in Paris uh, when he was 32. I researched his sick story for the Ahim Kroll suck, but I don't think it ever made it into the actual episode. I think it just uh, ended up in an earlier draft. Apologies if I'm not remembering correctly, and this is info we've covered at some point already, but even if it was, it's, it's been a while, and it's morbidly fascinating. Uh, Rene came to this pile of shit's apartment under the pretext of translating some poetry for him for a school assignment. Issei told authorities later he selected her for her health, strength, and beauty, characteristics he felt he lacked. She was 5'10", beautiful, athletic, uh, Sagawa, 4'9", feeble, uh, considered himself weak, ugly, and small. I agree. Uh, He said he wanted to absorb her energy. When she began reading poetry at a desk with her back to Sagawa, he shot her in the fucking neck with a rifle and then had sex with her corpse. Seems like he wanted to do more than absorb her energy. Uh, He now carved up her remains with a butcher knife, ate most of her breasts, face, buttocks, thigh, neck, either raw or cooked, ate her clitoris, uh, you know, for her power uh or for his boner. Took a lot of pics of her body, different stages of mutilation, stored some of the flesh in a fridge, uh, stuffed the rest of her remains into two suitcases. Then he got arrested by French authorities when he tried to dump those suitcases into a lake. He was found insane by the French court system, sentenced indefinitely to a mental institution. But then, while in the mental institution, uh, he was deported back to his native country of Japan. Officials at a mental institution in Japan then found him not to be insane. They felt that he committed his crimes because, you know, uh, turned him on. It was what he wanted sexually, not criminally insane, just a sick, perverted fuck. And yeah, they let him go. He's released since he'd never been criminally convicted in France. So due to winning this fucked up legal lottery, he's been living free ever since. Got away with it. Uh, Thankfully, after a brief period of infamy, when he made a living as an author and speaker, he became such a social pariah that he wasn't able to get any more work or sell any more books and has lived in poverty and shame now for decades. Also suffered some brain damage in 2013 that left him unable to do much of anything. So. Good. Uh, In an interview with Vice in 2010, a little while uh, before that brain damage, Sagawa said that human meat is odorless and not gamey. Also said that if given the chance, uh, he'd love to eat a Japanese woman. Saying, I think either uh, sukiyaki or shabu shabu is the best way to go in order to really savor the natural flavor of the meat. Fuck. God, what a dirtbag to take interviews and say shit like that after doing what he did. Uh, Surprised he was never accidentally like pushed in front of oncoming traffic or the victim of a mysterious suicide. Moving on to a different cannibal, a different cannibal for a bit now, William Seabrook. Uh, Seabrook was an early 20th century American occultist, explorer, author, and journalist who traveled to West Africa in the 1920s, where he documented in great detail an experience with the cannibal tribe. Initially, he said he partook of human flesh with the tribe that practiced cannibalism, then later admitted he made that up. But then, Upon returning to Paris after his journey, uh, he said he visited a local hospital where he obtained some samples of human meat and cooked it himself. 
to me, sneaking some cadaver steaks out of the local hospital is weirder than just eating along with the tribe that practices cultural cannibalism, eating the flesh of enemy warriors, killed in battle to take their power and stuff. Uh, Seabrook would write, it was like good, fully developed veal. Not young, but not yet beef. It was very definitely like that. And it was not like any other meat I've ever tasted. It was so nearly, <laughs> God, it was so nearly like good, fully developed veal that I think no person with a palate of ordinary normal sensitiveness could distinguish it from veal. It was mild, good meat with no other sharply defined or highly characteristic taste, such as, for instance, goat, high game, and pork half. The steak was slightly tougher than prime veal, a little stringy, but not too tough or stringy to be agreeably edible. The roast from which I cut and ate a central slice, my God, was tender and in color, texture, smell, as well as taste, strengthened by certainty that all, of all the meats we habitually know, veal is the one meat to which this meat is accurately comparable. Sounds like you ate from the corpse of a child. Also, how did this fuck obtain human meat from this hospital in France? I guess if you know the right guy, right? He was just willing to let you uh, sneak out some body parts for cash. How do you find that guy? Uh, Martha, d- didn't you say your cousin was a custodian who works at the hospital here in uh, Paris? Uh, yeah. uh, do you think if I slipped him uh, uh, a little cash, he'd give me a, a, a dead body? Uh, at least a leg? Uh, one more example. Uh, Onima Nelson grew up in Egypt, moved to the U.S. when she was 18 years old. When she was 23 in October of 1981, after working a few years off and on as a sex worker, she met a 56-year-old pilot, Bill Nelson. They got married a few days later. That's usually not the beginning of a, a, a strong relationship where people meet and get married a few days later. Not going to recommend that ever. Uh, then the very next month, November 28th, 1991, she said that her husband, Bill, had sexually assaulted her in their Costa Mesa, California apartment for the last time. She claimed he began his assaults as soon as they'd gotten married. And the Thanksgiving butcher, as she would be described in the papers, bludgeoned her much older husband with, a, with an iron and then stabbed him with scissors a lot of times. And then skinned his torso, chopped off his dick, uh, cooked his decapitated head, fried his hands in oil to remove his fingerprints. During the trial, it was revealed that as a a kid living in Cairo, she had undergone female genital mutilation and sex was traumatic and painful for her. Psychologists testified testified that she suffered from severe PTSD and also uh, was psychotic. Uh, Bill's alleged sexual assaults after suffering so much sexual trauma for so long triggered her losing her shit or that's what she claimed. Maybe she is just a fucking psychopath who made some stuff up to win sympathy from a jury. Uh, She told a psychiatrist she enjoyed eating his ribs, that they were very sweet. However, she said that uh, that could have been because (laughs) she dipped him in some barbecue sauce. (laughs) My God. She's eligible for parole again in 2026. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you had to eat a person, what part should you eat? Well, according to Yale certified nutritionist, Dr. Jim Stepani, you should dig that fork and steak knife into a moob. Best cut of man meat. Yeah, fuck yeah, bro. Mm-hmm. Tender, juicy man titties. There's nothing else like them, uh, from what I hear, of course. Uh, they have a lot more meat on them than lady tits, but are still tender. Very flavorful. It's uh, allegedly like the best ribeye you've ever had. And if you're not afraid to chew in a little bit of hair, try and hold this vomit in, you're definitely going to want to eat some man nipple. That's the best part is what this guy says. The the hairier, the better, says Dr. Stepani. That's a direct quote. He said, hair follicles uh, will affect flavor uh, and a floppy man tit covered in testosterone-fueled chest pubes, bon appetit. And, ah, you know, send my regards to the chef, simply exquisite. Dr. Stepani added in an interview for Gourmet Magazine, and I quote, I choose eating a medium rare, hairy man tit with a furry half dollar nipple on top over Rihanna trying to suck the skin off my cock any day, twice on Sunday. <laughs> Sorry. That was nonsense. You know that. Uh, what Yale certified nutritionist Dr. Jim Sapani really said, I wish he would have said that other stuff. But what he really said was that uh, the human brain and muscles are probably your best bet. Oh, muscles, really. Uh, thanks, Dr. Stepani. Is, your, uh, is that your real last name, Stepani, or is it obvious? Of course, muscles are the best part to eat, Dr. Obvious. And yeah, I guess the brain would be next. I mean, what the fuck else would be next? What would rank higher? Uh, bones, eyeballs, nuts? Uh, Dr. Obvious said that muscles offer protein. And the brain would provide slow burning energy since it's high in fat. He said that the liver and kidneys are filled with waste products since they're a part of the body's filtration system. So best to avoid those. <laughs> he said that eyes contain an acidic solution, which can make humans sick. So careful eating human eyeballs. And fingers and toes are filled with cartilage, which your body won't digest. So, you know, maybe don't eat any like toes. Also said that <laughs> he also said that penises are spongy. 
and have little nutritional value. So maybe don't eat, you know, people's dicks. Spongy? Is this guy a real doctor? Uh, sorry we couldn't find a better doctor to weigh in on cannibalism. Uh, you might not want to listen to Dr. Obvious when it comes to eating brains, actually, unless you're a zombie. Then obviously, you know, you're going to eat whatever the fuck you want. From what I understand, zombies don't really have to worry about digestive issues or, uh, you know, catching any serious illnesses from eating the wrong meat. That's one of the best parts of being a zombie. But if you're not a zombie, eating the brain of another human being can give you kuru, a brain disease similar to mad cow disease. Kuru occurs because our brains contain prions that can transmit this disease. Symptoms begin with trembling, progress to severe loss of muscle control and trouble swallowing and end in death. After catching Kuru, it can take years or even decades for this disease to begin to manifest symptoms. Don't think you're off the hook because you felt fine the last couple of years since eating that lady tit or moob or fucking, you know, dick, couple, whatever. Uh, the four people from Papua New Guinea practice eating their dead relatives as a sign of respect. But then it came back to, no pun intended, haunt them when thousands of four contracted Kuru and died. Super rare disease. But maybe only super rare because cannibalism is super rare. Uh, basically, it's probably a bad idea health-wise to eat people. Uh, not going to want to trade that trade that protein, um, you know, uh, for, or, you know, like smoothie or whatever, or, or tuna fish sandwich for some uh, Donnie or Linda steaks to make sure uh, you get your daily protein needs met. And then there's the psychological toll cannibalism can take on you. Yes, you're not going to get rid of memories of chowing down on another person very easily. Probably depends on how you get the meat, though. You know, killing someone, butchering their dead body, eating parts that might fuck you up a little more than, say, having a piece of what you thought was veal. And then after you eat it, someone's like, surprise, that wasn't veal. That was Ricky. Uh, despite the physical and psychological risks, meat sacks do have a long history of eating other meat sacks because, you know, well, we're full of meat. Sometimes you just need that meat. And there aren't uh, other non-human places to get the sweet meat you want. Let's dive into a summary of the history of meat sacks, eating meat sacks now. The term cannibalism derived from the Spanish name for the uh, Carib, a West Indies tribe, who were thought to have practiced cannibalism. Unclear if they actually did, though. In the early 1500s, the Spanish accused the Caribbean tribe of uh, ritualistically eating their enemies, but modern-day scholars have doubts that happened. Because the Caribs were engaged in an anti-colonial battle with a host of European powers, many historians now argue that cannibalism rumors were just a propaganda tactic by the Spanish, meant to stir up fear, right? Meant to uh, justify killing. On the other hand, we do have some evidence that the Caribs did use body parts as trophies, so cannibalism is a possibility, especially as an intimidation measure or act of war. However, most of our initial testimony comes from uh, Columbus, who had many propaganda and rationalizing atrocities-based reasons to make the Caribs seem as savage as possible. Uh, true or not, the name stuck around. Uh, cannibalism began way before the days of the Caribs and Columbus, though, of course. Anthropological data shows that millions of years ago, Homo antecessor, the link between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens were cannibalistic for nutritional reasons. Just needed that meat and men and women were the easiest meaty creatures for them to hunt. Humans eventually developed more advanced hunting techniques in order to prey on animals since consuming each other, not a sustainable food source, harder to keep the species going if the species is spending too much time eating itself. Uh, though, uh, or, yeah, yeah, though many early accounts of cannibalism probably were exaggerated or in error, the practice prevailed all over the world amongst various early tribes of humans until modern times. There's all kinds of evidence of widespread cannibalism in parts of West and Central Africa, uh, Melanesia, especially Fiji, New Guinea, uh, Australia among the uh, Mores of New Zealand and some of the islands of Polynesia amongst tribes of Sumatra, various tribes of both North and South America. Europe boasts the oldest fossil evidence of cannibalism in somewhat modern history. In a 1999 science article, French paleontologists reported that 100,000-year-old bones from six Neanderthal victims found in a French cave have been broken by other Neanderthals in such a way as to extract their marrow and brains. Right? They ate all of these other early humans. Or there was zombie Neanderthals. Or there was some zombies running around back then. Uh, in some past cultures, eating human flesh was looked upon as no different as eating the flesh of any other animal. Right? Food's food. In other cultures, eating people, proof of dominance and supremacy over one's enemies. Victorious Mores often cut up the bodies of the dead after battle, feasted on the flesh. And the Batak of Sumatra were reported to have sold human flesh in markets, right? Until the, uh, uh, their culture fell under the control of the Dutch at the dawn of the 20th century. So not that long ago, you know, you go down to the equivalent of the farmer's market, you know, and get some, uh, get some dude meat, get some lady meat. Uh, the last Batak kingdom didn't fall until 1907. In other cultures, the consumption of particular portions or organs are part of rituals for gaining the power of a consumed person or otherwise as part of some, you know, larger uh, magic ritual. Ritual murder and cannibalism in Africa 
often uh, related to sorcery. Headhunters, others often consume bits of the bodies or heads of deceased enemies as a means of absorbing their vitality or other qualities, uh, reducing their powers for, you know, uh, revenge from the afterlife or in order to be able to craft, I don't know, various fucking wizard spells and make different potions and stuff. The Aztecs apparently practiced cannibalism on a large scale as part of the ritual religious sacrifice of war captives and other victims. And in some cases around the world throughout history, the body of a dead person was ritually eaten by his relatives, a form called endocannibalism. Some Aboriginal Australians performed such practices as uh, acts of respect. Likewise, the Four Tribe of Papua New Guinea I mentioned earlier, known to have eaten the bodies of their deceased family members, this practice was seen as a sign of love, love and respect, preventing the corpses from rotting or being devoured by insects. That's so fucking weird. Don't let Grandpa rot! Eat him! Come on! Show some respect. In addition, the ritual was thought to protect the body from uh, dangerous spirits. Centuries ago in China, human-based dishes were uh, once considered a luxury. During the uh, Yuan Dynasty from the 13th, uh, or in the 14th, 13th and 14th centuries, noted that children's meat was the, be- <laughs> was the best food of all when it came to taste. I fucking knew, I knew kids were the tastiest. God, playgrounds across the world full of so much soft, tender, delicious human veal just going to waste. When are we going to wise up and start eating kids? We could probably end world hunger if we just put kids on the menu. Less mouths to feed. More mouths getting fed. Um, China also reported cases of kids cutting off various body parts, usually a section of the thigh or upper arm, to use in dishes for their elders as a show of respect. Fucking what? No matter how small the piece of meat they were cutting off, that is insane. I picture some eight-year-old slicing a piece of their forearm off, tossing it in a skillet, and some hungry uncle <laughs> just watching them, just licking his chops. Oh, come on! That's all the respect you have for me? Don't be stingy. Don't you love your uncle? Come on, give me a nice fat chunk. You're young. It'll grow back. Uh, Then there's history of medicinal cannibalism. Pre-modern Chinese medicine sometimes included human organs as well as uh, fingernails, hair. While in early Greece, human blood was thought effective in treating epilepsy. And even as they were decrying cannibals in the new world as savages, Europeans were routinely consuming human parts as medicinal treatment. Followers of 16th century Swiss physician uh, Peric... Pericles, for example, tried to cure dysentery with medicines that contained powdered human skulls. In 17th century England, pulverized mummies used in treatments for epilepsy and stomach aches. In some cases, not just any mummy would do. One concoction called for the body of a redheaded man who had died from hanging. Holy shit, that is very specific and familiar. I feel like I've mentioned that random bit of odd historical fact somewhere before. Imagine hearing your doctor tell you that today. Yeah, buddy, this tummy ache you got is, uh, it's no joke. It's probably, it's probably cancer or something. Not going to be easy to get rid of. You didn't hear this from me, but your best bet, find a ginger and hang him. Grind up his gingery bones, make a, make a soup and eat that and eat some meat off his legs too. And I don't know, eat one of his eyeballs or something for good measure. You can't be too thorough. After all that, according to this medical book, uh, I've been reading, written by a severely mentally ill imbecile, you should be as good as new. Uh, People have used so many different justifications to eat other people throughout recorded human history. There's no one satisfactory, all-inclusive explanation for cannibalism. Different peoples have practiced it for different reasons, right? The same group may practice cannibalism in one context, view it with horror in another. In any case, the spread of modern, uh, you know, farming techniques, livestock domestication, uh, the industrial revolution that created processed foods, etc., combined with the global spread of various religions morally demonizing cannibalistic practices the past several centuries has almost completely eradicated any culturally condoned cannibalism today. In modern society, cannibalism usually occurs as either the result of insanity or extreme physical necessity in isolated surroundings, like being stuck on a desert island. Probably the two most famous examples of survival cannibalism involve two uh, two suck subjects I mentioned earlier, the Donner Party and the Andes flight disaster. In 1846, right, 87 pioneers led by George Donner left Independence, Missouri, Bound for California in December, those settlers who hadn't already McGill's popped off the buttholes, don't worry about that reference if you don't get it, uh, became trapped by heavy snow in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Facing starvation, the people eventually resorted to cannibalism. The story became well-known, thanks in part to media reports that did sensationalize it. Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571, a chartered flight from uh, Montevideo, Uruguay, bound for Santiago, Chile, that crashed in the Andes Mountains on October 13th, 1972, is the other big story. The flight was carrying 45 passengers and crew, including 19 members of the old Christians Club rugby union team, along with their family supporters and friends. 
Remember that episode's nonsense? Conga, 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 this plane is dancing, conga. Some more guys just flew out, uh, another wing broke off, but we still have enough to fuck him all, Gregory, well, let's fucking go! Uh, the flight crashed in the remote Andes of far western Argentina, just east of the border with Chile. During the following 72 days, the survivors suffered extreme hardships, including exposure, starvation, and avalanche, which led to the deaths of 13 more passengers. The remaining passengers resorted to cannibalism. And then there are some lesser known, much more disturbing modern examples of uh, cannibalism that uh, some people have tried to pass off as survival cannibalism, but was not. Numerous Japanese soldiers during World War II consumed POWs and did not need to. It wasn't always because they were hungry and had no viable options, other options for protein. Nearly a half century after World War II, historian uh, Toshiyuki Tanaka revealed his findings in the first ever Japanese investigation into cannibalism during the war. And Tanaka found a lot. Born after his home country's defeat, Tanaka wanted to educate young Japanese people who are not told anything about this war crime, he said. In 1992, Tanaka publicly announced that he uncovered more than 100 thoroughly documented cases of cannibalism committed by Japanese troops in Papua New Guinea. All right, these documents clearly show that this cannibalism was done by a whole group of Japanese soldiers, and in some cases, they were not starving, Tanaka said. The wide variety of cases include uh, these soldiers eating the flesh of Australian soldiers, Asian laborers, uh, indigenous people in Papua New Guinea. In some instances, these soldiers' supply lines were indeed cut off, and they were genuinely hungry. But in other cases, officers ordered troops to eat human flesh to give them a, a feeling of victory. According to the testimony of a surviving Pakistani corporal who was captured in Singapore and housed as a prisoner of war in Papua New Guinea, Japanese soldiers on the island killed and ate about a prisoner a day for about 100 days. One Indian prisoner of the war said that the Japanese started selecting prisoners and every day one prisoner was taken out and killed and eaten by the soldiers. I personally saw this happen. And about 100 prisoners were eaten at this place by the Japanese. <laughs> Fuck. The remainder of us were taken to another spot 50 miles away where 10 prisoners died of sickness. At this place, the Japanese again started selecting prisoners to eat. Those selected were taken to a hut where their flesh was cut from their bodies while they were still alive and they were thrown into a ditch where they died later. What the fuck? Why were they still alive? That is some seriously savage shit. And it wasn't just prisoners of war who bore witness. One Australian army corporal recalled how he discovered several mutilated bodies, bodies of his own comrades when patrolling an area of battle. One of the bodies had only the hands and feet left untouched. Another Australian lieutenant described finding dismembered remains of bodies as such. In all cases, the condition of the remains were such that there can be no doubt that the bodies had been dismembered and portions of flesh cooked. Rikimi Yamamoto, a Japanese soldier, part of a group fighting in the Philippines, the Suzuki unit, later testified in court after being charged with war crimes. We frequently ate human meat as our dinner, boiled it with, boiled it with vegetables and ate it. The meat was brought into camp by patrols who had cut it up and dressed it. Sometimes, and this is not the Papua New Guinea, this is like uh, in, a, in a different area. Sometimes the meat was dried and the sun cured. Since there was no other meat available, we had to eat human flesh. For this reason, Filipinos were captured and butchered. I was so hungry I ate it, although I would, I would have preferred pork. <laughs> Jesus. These Filipinos you talk about, you're not soldiers, just random villagers. These Japanese soldiers were literally hunting to eat. A future U.S. president almost got eaten in World War II. September 2nd, 1944, an American plane carrying nine U.S. airmen crash-landed above the Japanese Bonin Islands after being shot down by enemy soldiers while all the soldiers uh, attempted to escape. Um, you know, almost all were captured by the Japanese. One succeeded in escaping, a young man named George H.W. Bush. Did you know that the first Bush president was a war hero? Dude flew 58 combat missions during the war. Guy was a badass. Then a U.S. Navy lieutenant, the future president, evacuated the doomed aircraft at just the right moment was promptly rescued by an American submarine. His peers, not so lucky. Captured by the Japanese soldiers, these crew members were tortured, stabbed, and beheaded, and some were cannibalized. Yep, some of President Bush's friends were fucking eaten in World War II. The shit that they don't teach you in history classes. Too taboo. In this case, the soldiers who ate human flesh definitely weren't starving. Instead, they turned to cannibalism on the orders of Japanese Lieutenant General Yoshio Tachibana, who had four men butchered for their livers and thighs. As Admiral Kino, uh, Kino's, uh, shit. Kinizo, Kinizo Mora's later testimony would reveal a chef had the liver pierced with bamboo sticks and cooked with soy sauce and vegetables. The dish was apparently treated as if it were some kind of delicacy. Uh, according to Mori, it was believed to be good for the stomach. According to Japanese folklore, the liver is the organ of the body where courage and power dwells. So perhaps these soldiers believed that consuming the liver of a human would give them the courage and power the person had while alive. 
After the war, at least one soldier implied that was the case. When uh, questioned at his trial in Guam for his conduct, Major Matoba responded that he ate the human liver to gain the strength of a tiger. Uh, even more recently, Ugandan leader Idi Amin, whose regime lasted from 1971 to 1979, a man we talked about just a few months ago in episode 315, uh, just over a month ago, the uh, movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God cult. He was accused of cannibalizing his opponents and he responded with a non-denial saying, I don't like human flesh. It's too salty for me. Hmm. Sounds like he ate it. Even today, some women eat their placentas, right? The organ that attaches a fetus to the uterine wall after they give birth, citing some health benefits. According to some who've eaten placenta has the consistency of, again, veal, but doesn't quite taste like beef. So much fucking veal uh, talk with us meat sacks. Apparently we're a, we're a tender ass species. Some mothers get their doula or a professional placenta preparer to dry and then encapsulate their placenta make it into a broth, or cook and serve it post-childbirth. Yikes! Recently, some celebrities have gotten in on this trend. Women like Hilary Duff, Kourtney Kardashian, uh, January Jones. Others have said that they have eaten their placenta for health benefits. All right. Kind of grosses me out, and by kind of, I mean, it makes me want to fucking throw up if I think too much about it. But I guess a placenta, uh, different than, say, eating some tit meat, Ripper Crew style. Uh, in nature, many mammals actually do eat their own placenta for nutrition, but humans don't need to do that because we're able to rebuild our bodies after pregnancy through vitamins and regular uh, food. So probably don't need to to lap up that placenta broth. Probably going to be fine without enduring that fucking horror. Might not want to look to Kourtney Kardashian or Hillary Duff for nutritional life hacks. Uh, placenta aside, why does anyone ever want to eat human flesh today? Well, if you're starving... An average human body contains more than 125,000 calories. That's a feast. But what if you're not starving? What if culturally you don't think that consuming the flesh of your enemy will give you tiger strength? What if you're not trying to absorb the power of your fallen enemies, right? There could be only one Highlander. According to Professor Gerard Labouchain, a South African clinical psychologist, people who eat human flesh, in his experience, usually have mental health problems. Well, no fucking shit. He and Dr. Obvious should open up a private practice together. They can market it as uh, schedule an appointment with Dr. Obvious and Professor No Shit uh, today so you can tell your friends, hey, I was right. My doctor didn't tell me anything. I didn't already know. Uh, Labouchain says that people accused of eating human flesh usually are eating it because, uh, you know, they're having an, uh, a psychotic episode, which can include hallucinations where the perpetrator hears voices or sees images. He said, in my experience, it usually has nothing to do with rituals as is often believed. So other than the vague character characterization of they're fucking crazy, no one really knows why anyone living in the modern world, that is to say anyone with no cultural reason to take part in cannibalism, would want to do this. Despite being labeled as crazy, cannibalism is not listed as a mental illness in the DSM, the standard classification of mental disorders used by mental health professionals across the U.S. That doesn't help us much. Some psychologists have speculated that it may relate to childhood trauma relating to separation anxiety from the mother resulting in oral aggression, but that is... Total speculation. Sometimes criminals who commit acts of cannibalism are found to suffer from schizophrenia. So again, you know, mental illness. Perhaps the most horrific version of what drives some to cannibalism is the one that Gil Valley fantasized about. The one I have to imagine he still fantasizes about. The kind where people derive sexual satisfaction from consuming humans or thinking about consuming humans. No one has any fucking idea where that fantasy comes from. Comes from. Yeah, many have speculated. No one actually knows. It varies from person to person. Uh, when they reveal why they uh, you know, have done what they have done or thought about what they've thought about. During the trial of one German cannibal that we'll cover in a second, a guy named uh, Armin Muse, or uh, I think it's, uh, I have the pronunciation here in a second, uh, Mivus, there we go, Armin Mivus, uh, he revealed his motivation saying uh, that he'd always dreamt of having a younger brother, quote, someone to be a part of me, his only child, had became fascinated with cannibalism as a way to fulfill that obsession but then also later admitted it was sexual too. So, okay. That falls under insane. I think, uh, importantly, uh, he, he's, he's not, not alone. You know, uh, he was not alone. He was looking to find someone to eat. He uh, had contact with over 400 men on the internet who were also interested in cannibalism, all with different uh, reasons, I imagine, for beginning to fantasize about it. I shared a summary of Mivas' story in the Yahim Kroll suck, and it's worth sharing today to provide context to Gil Valley, just like it provided context for, for uh, Kroll's actions. Uh, and it was over 100 episodes back, so I imagine the details have been forgotten by most of us. According to uh, Issei Sagawa, the Japanese cannibal we met earlier, his obsession with cannibalism came in part, as I briefly mentioned earlier, from his own physical weakness. He would say to Vice, I was physically weak from the moment I was born. My legs were so skinny, they looked like pencils. <laughs> it was in the first grade of elementary school when I saw the quivering meat on a male classmate's thighs, and I suddenly thought, hmm, that looks delicious. 
but I'm not homosexual. So from around the time I entered junior high, I became obsessed with the Western actress Grace Kelly. Not really a meaty actress. An obsession that lasted right through high school. That was the beginning of my infatuation with Occidental people. Before I knew it, tall, healthy-looking Western women became the trigger for my cannibalistic fantasies. I guess my infatuation with such women stemmed from the fact that I was short, ugly, and had an inferiority complex, and therefore sought people who were the exact opposite of myself. It was like a sympathy ploy a little bit there. Eventually, I began feeling a strong desire to bite into them. Not to kill them or eat them per se, but merely to gnaw on their flesh. Oh, that's all. It was purely a form of sexual desire. I wasn't like I felt, uh, it wasn't like I felt like eating someone every time I was hungry. But you know how you tend to feel a stronger sexual desire when you've eaten a full meal? That's when I would start feeling the urge to eat a girl. Is that true for anyone listening? Do you feel extra horny after eating a big meal? I do not. I don't know anyone who feels that way. Uh, he just tossed that out as if it's a commonly accepted fact. I don't think so. When I've just stuffed myself with like Thanksgiving dinner, I don't think uh, I've ever thought, man, I'm horny right now. Every Thanksgiving, I barely cram in that second helping of mashed potatoes and gravy and cranberry sauce and then shove down a piece of pumpkin pie and then I want to go get to fucking. How about you, ladies? Do you feel the most sexy when you've just eaten so much at one meal that at any sudden moment, right, or any sudden with any sudden movement, you know, you could just like let a fart out? I doubt it. He continues. It's absurd, right? In essence, it's different from the type of hunger that people experience for food. This cannibalistic urge where I'm going, I want to eat human meat, is sort of sexual appetite. So if I don't make sure that I ejaculate frequently enough, the desire only gets stronger and stronger. I'm afraid to think about how much that weirdo beats off to keep his demons at bay. Uh, Sagawa would specify that he didn't want to kill the girl in his fantasy. He just wanted to eat her. Uh-huh. As if that's two separate things. And apparently those fantasies persist to this day. He'd say, well, apparently those fantasies persist to the point of this interview. Again, I don't know since he's gotten brain damage since his interview. But he'd say in the interview, I still have the sexual appetite of wanting to eat a beautiful woman's body. For example, if a normal man fancied a girl, he'd naturally feel a desire to see her as often as possible, to be close to her, to smell her and kiss her, right? To me, eating is just an extension of that. Obviously, the general public doesn't understand, but the thing is, sure, I want to eat the girl, but I don't necessarily want to kill her in the process. What a fucking insane headspace to live in. Yikes. Too bad he couldn't have just, uh, you know, made do with like fingernails, uh, you know, menstrual blood. Then he could kind of eat the woman of his desires in a way that might, you know, gross her the fuck out, but wouldn't harm her. Many of the news stories we see today about cannibalism result from psychotic episodes brought on by drugs. Uh, That was what happened in the case of the infamous Miami face-eating incident of 2012 when Rudy Eugene ingested bath salts and then started biting off Ronald Popo's face. Uh, Similarly, March 21st, 2010, Gerard Wyatt of Crescent City, California killed his friend and MMA sparring partner, Taylor Powell, after they both drank some mushroom tea. Powell was found without most of his face and a large incision in his chest. Wyatt told arresting officers he had cut out Powell's heart and burned it because he thought Powell was possessed by the devil. That trip sounds like a fucking nightmare. I, I I thought I'd gone hard on mushrooms in the past. I've never considered eating anyone's face. Wyatt Powell, the third acquaintance, and Wyatt's ex-girlfriend all drank mushroom tea. Uh, Wyatt had been in a good mood before ingesting it, but then the men's behavior changed almost immediately. Somebody fucking spiked that tea. I feel like these fuckers had more than just shrooms in that tea. Wyatt began complaining that his eyes were burning. That's, that's not a thing from shrooms. Tried to prevent the uh, third man from leaving, uh, even jumping on top of his car as he drove away. Did they, did they maybe uh, think they made mushroom tea, but made it with meth instead? Meth! Uh, this, sounds, this sounds a lot like meth. When Wyatt told police he didn't want the man to leave because he was convinced a tidal wave was coming. Powell held him down on the kitchen floor, saying none of them could be saved from the wave and that the world was going to come to an end. Uh, at one point, Wyatt, Wyatt yelled at Powell to get his guitar. <laughs> what the fuck? Powell responded angrily when asked to uh, get his guitar, saying, you want to fucking die? Over and over and over. Uh, Did they maybe mix angel dust and meth into the tea and then chase the tea with bath salts and fucking crack? Uh, The ex-girlfriend testified that Wyatt and Powell started now to wrestle on the kitchen floor uh, and then they started talking about surfing. (laughs) What the hell? And then she said that later she saw Powell standing uh, over Wyatt spitting on him. And then she heard sounds that she thought were sexual in nature. (laughs) What is happening here? Somehow things escalated a lot from that point and Wyatt removed Powell's heart when he was still alive, according to a coroner's report. How is that possible? It's like some Indiana Jones Temple of Doom shit. Then he cooked his body parts in the stove because he was fearful that Powell was still alive and he needed to, quote, stop the devil. Schizophrenia, maybe? Did there there meth and bath salt flavored PCP mushroom tea? 
bring out underlying schizophrenia? When police arrived, they found Wyatt standing over Powell, naked and covered in his blood, saying, I killed him. And then asking uh, them if God was coming to save him. <laughs> Fuck. You know, it's not funny, but that's just so outrageous. I still plan on experimenting quite a bit more with psychedelics after this, by the way. Uh, just going to uh, have to not read anything about cannibalism before future trips. Hoping I can forget this story and quickly. So drug use can lead you to some horrific acts of cannibalism. That's great. But what if you had the opportunity to eat some human flesh in a nice way, in an ethical way? Whatever that is, should you do it? Is it okay just to eat a little bit? Just put the tip in, see how it feels? Probably not. In addition to health concerns I've already talked about, it's also uh, illegal to varying degrees. In the U.S., there are no laws against cannibalism per se, but most, if not all, states have enacted laws that indirectly make it impossible to legally obtain and consume body parts. Further, uh, even if someone consents to being eaten and kills themselves, the cannibal may still be liable for criminal or civil actions based on laws governing the abuse or desecration of a corpse, which vary from state to state. Most criminals who commit acts of cannibalism charged with murder, desecration of a corpse, or necrophilia or some combination. This is even true in the case of an emergency, like being stranded on an island, or at least has been in the past. Uh, In British common law, the system of laws that the U.S.'s laws are based on, necessity, not a defense for murder. That was established a long time ago in the case of Regina versus Dudley and Stevens, an English criminal case brought before the courts way back in 1884. Four men, including Dudley and Stevens, had been marooned on a raft after their ship was destroyed in a storm. They had no fresh water, very little food. In desperation, one of the men drank seawater to slake his thirst. Not a good idea. Made him sick with dehydration and eventually he lost consciousness. Dudley then killed him and then the three survivors drank his blood, ate his meat for the next week before being rescued. Despite their very dire circumstances, despite evidence that the victim was near death anyway by the time Dudley killed him, despite the fact that the defendants may have died had they not eaten him, they were still found guilty and sentenced to death. But their sentences were later commuted to just six months in prison, so maybe sometimes it's a good idea to eat people. More recently, and importantly, not out of necessity, in 2001, now we're circling back to that uh, Armin Mivas, 39-year-old German man talked about earlier, uh, found someone through a cannibalism fetish website to consent to being killed and eaten. This is a story I told during the Kroll episode, and it's just as unbelievable and shocking to me the second time around. This is one of the most fucked up stories I've ever read about. Uh, The website Mivas was poking around on was the now defunct Cannibal Cafe, whose disclaimer mentioned the distinction between reality and fantasy. Mivas' post stated that he was looking for a well-built 18 to 30 year old to be slaughtered and then consumed. And someone actually responded. Numerous people responded to this. Right? Several people responded were like, oh, fuck yeah, bro. I'm your guy. Well, he didn't find an 18 to 30 year old. His future victim was 43, but he looked young. 43 year old uh, Burned Brandis, known for an obsession with fantasies of self mutilation and the homosexual prostitution scene of his home city. Uh, Brandis originally uh, was employed, excuse me, by Siemens AG in a managerial capacity until his death. Manager by day, guy who wanted to be sliced up and, and eaten at night. Brandis replied to Mivas' post and they arranged to meet so Mivas could kill and eat Brandis. Uh, Just a slightly atypical first date. According to a videotape the two made when they met in March of 2001 in Mivas' home, Mivas amputated... Oh boy. Mivas, every time it's still shocking. Amputated Brandis' penis and then Mivas and Brandis together ate this dick. (laughs) What the fuck? Uh, And then Brandis was killed. Tragic or beautiful? I mean, Brandis did die doing what he loved, eating his own dick. He actually did want to do that. I want to say that he was completely out of his mind, but this fucker worked at a good company, made good money, lived a stable life, you know, <laughs> he knew what he was doing, likely was not, you know, insane in the classic sense. As bad as this sounds already, it was worse. Uh, Brandis insisted that Mivas was to bite his penis off. That was the deal they made. That was, and that was the deal. Like he, he wanted that detail. He wanted this guy to bite his dick off, but Mivas was not able to do that. It was tougher, harder than he thought to chew off this guy's dick. So then he used a knife. The first one turned out to be too blunt. And then he finally got a sharper knife to cut it off. Uh, Brand, Brand is still alive and conscious after all that and hungry. Apparently he had taken 20 sleeping pills on top of painkillers and alcohol to be able to handle all this. Normally I'm guessing 20 sleeping pills would put you in a coma, but you know, when you have somebody try and gnaw your dick off, probably snaps out of that coma pretty quick. Brandis apparently tried to eat his share of his own penis rare. <laughs> God, the story. Uh, he said it was too tough. And uh, as he put it, chewy. So Mivas then sauteed this motherfucker's cock in a pan with some salt, pepper, and garlic. What were they talking about as he was cooking? <laughs> 
Do you want some more wine, Bernd? Sorry if you weren't able to enjoy your portion of your dick raw, as you had hoped. It, it'll cook up real nice and you'll, you'll love it. Uh, it, it I, I use it my mother's favorite savory dick recipe. It's to die for. No pun intended. It, I cannot believe I said that. So do you want to watch uh, Kirby Enthusiasm? <laughs> what would Larry David think of all this? Like if Larry David was cooking your dick and you didn't enjoy the way he prepared it, would he completely forget about you dying? Because he gets so mad that you're not appreciating how he's trying his best. <laughs> what do you tell his manager, Jeff Garland, about it next day? He's gloss over how vitally inappropriate all this is and just focus on how rude you're being not to enjoy the way he tried to feed you dick. You know, especially because he tasted it. He thinks it's excellent. <laughs> Brenda, are you there? Sorry, I'm being so silly. You over there passing out from blood loss after having dick cut off. Trying to eat it, I blab away about curb enthusiasm. It's ironically very Larry David way to behave. I have no idea what that accent was. I wasn't planning that. Uh, according to journalists who saw the horrific video of all this, the video was never made public, thank God, or my dark curiosity would have absolutely led to me watching it. Brandis may have ended up too weakened from blood loss to eat his full share of the penis. Uh, Mivas apparently gave Brandis uh, large quantities of alcohol, yeah, painkillers, so he could handle all those sleeping pills. Then after their lovely d- dinner, he killed him in a room he'd created specifically for the, that purpose in his house, as was Brandis' wish. Then he continued to eat the body over the next 20 months, storing parts of it in a secret compartment of his deep freeze. Uh, Mivis would be arrested in December of 2002 after apparently posting new advertisements, trying to get a new victim on the internet. Uh, investigators searched his home, found body parts and videotaped uh, and the videotaped killing. The video was apparently so disturbing that many of the jurors who later saw it uh, had to seek psychological counseling. I have to deal with a memory of what they witnessed. Fuck. Maybe, maybe I wouldn't watch it if I had the chance. At least not. I'll, I probably would. Uh, Mivas was later convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. The case attracted considerable media attention, led to a debate over uh, whether Mivas could be convicted at all, given the Brandis, you know, voluntarily wanted to say, like, like asked for this to happen, knowingly participate in this act, willingly. This kind of debate would continue with the uh, Gill Valley case, although in a more theoretical form. Uh, back to wrapping up Mivas now, though. In April of 2005, a German court ordered a retrial after prosecutors appealed a sentence they believed he should have been convicted of murder, not manslaughter, and given a life sentence. The court wanted to know if Brandis, uh, Brandis was actually even capable of giving consent to be murdered, taking into account his mental health history, as well as his drug and alcohol habit. And they didn't say in the articles what that history was. So maybe it wasn't as stable as I once suspected. Uh, other aspects of the retrial determined whether Mivas killed to satiate his own desires, in particular sexual, de- uh, in particular sexual desires, and not because he was asked to, which Mivas repeatedly rejected during testimony. At the retrial, the psychologist stated that Mivas could reoffend and still had fantasies about devouring the flesh of young people. And that was enough to persuade the German court to resentence him. On May 9th, 2006, in a court in Frankfurt, uh, Mivas convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. He told uh, Brandis in chats online that he wanted to eat more than just Brandis and said he wanted to kidnap and eat someone else. And that likely affected the uh, court's decision very much. Also over 20 months, you know, ate 44 pounds of the guy's flesh, clearly developed a taste for it, uh, likely wanted more, said he wanted more. Uh, here's what he would say about the taste for his first true meal after Brandis was dead and he, and he butchered him. He said, I decorated the table with nice candles. I took out my best dinner service, fried a piece of rump steak, a piece from his back, made what I call princess potatoes and sprouts. After I prepared my meal, I ate it. Told the court that the meal tasted like pork, but stronger, more substantial. Prosecutors also said that his primary motivation wasn't nourishment, but sexual gratification. All this turned him on immensely. Sexual details about the case are rare, but for both Armin uh, Mivas and uh, Bernd uh, Brandis, this was all erotic, something they'd been sexually fantasizing about for years. Man, one man fantasizing about killing and eating another man, the other man fantasizing about being eaten. And you thought you were kinky. Interestingly, nothing written about the two men actually fucking or engaging in any type of traditional sexual activity. Okay, now that we looked into why we humans have eaten each other, for how long we've eaten each other, uh, what may psychologically motivate us to want to eat someone else, including for sexual reasons, which we have no fucking idea why people are wired that way. Let's learn a lot more about Gil Valley's story, the so-called cannibal cop in this week's Time Suck Timeline, right after a word from one of my favorite sponsors that we haven't uh, heard from in, in, in quite some time. Today's Time Suck brought to you by, once again, first time in a long time, Trolls Cafe and Malt Shop. Hello, fellow diner and sexy cow lover. This is Jan Kroll. I want you to come to my diner in Bratford Schnitzel. We always have the finest chocolate malt and the sexiest cow burgers. 
and the best menu blue light specials. This week, we have the chewiest mystery meat dogs in town. They taste a lot like pork, but stronger, more substantial. Don't ask where we gotten it, and I won't scare you. And bring the kiddies. All these kiddies allow me to cover their plates with copious amounts of semen bran fry sauce. Our semen bran fry sauce is quite delicious. Our rich and creamy recipe is made in-house by myself every morning. So come on down to Kroll's Cafe, where it's always mostly beef, I promise. And get ready for Kroll's Cafe to open uh, a location near you. Over 100 new locations opening worldwide in 2023 for Kroll's Cafe. Now a subsidiary of Bear Evil Incorporated. Oh my. Soon, we'll own fucking everything. We'll own you. And there's nothing you can do to stop Bear Evil Incorporated. You're addicted to consumption. We have the analytics. We know what you want, and we're going to keep selling it to you. And then we're going to use the profit you give us to fucking destroy you. And yeah, we are telling you our end game. That's how fucking dominant we are. We call our shots. We never miss. It's incredible what you can accomplish when you only care about money. You can open up a hundred new locations, over a hundred of a restaurant that serves customers, other customers. Jesus Christ, that was a that was the scariest message from Bear yet. That wasn't even a, that wasn't even a fucking commercial. That was just a a direct threat. I thought they were only in it for the money, not just not just murder. Now it seems like they mostly just want to kill us all. Uh, What's well, nice to hear from Kroll's Cafe though? I am happy they got a, a big round of new funding. If you're super confused and want to learn more about how we uh, got hooked up with that wonderful sponsor uh, and stick with the cannibalism theme, just go back and listen to Suck 197. And then maybe also Sucks 316 and 317 to learn about Bear or, you know, just just let it go. Uh, let's get to that timeline now. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck timeline. On April 14th, 1984, the man who would later come to be known as the cannibal cop, Gilberto Valley, uh, born in Queens, New York. He displayed behavior that, looking back, did wave some pretty red flags early on. In 1990, when he was in kindergarten, he was suspected for several days of biting a female classmate repeatedly over uh, several weeks. When her parents contacted the school and their daughter showed them some bite marks on her shoulder and Gil was questioned, he said he was just trying to be funny. He was only five, so his behavior was written off as him just being an odd kid, right? He'd grow out of it, but he wouldn't. Early 1993, when he was eight, his cousin threw a fit when he put one of their Barbie dolls in uh, his aunt's oven, set it to broil, and waited to eat him. His parents, again, thought he was just being a weird little kid. He was given a spanking, sent to his room for the rest of the day. They all moved on, assumed this was a one-time incident. Not exactly. Late 1997, when he was 13, his mom walked in on him masturbating to a picture from a medical anatomy textbook he had checked out from the local library. Then his dad caught him masturbating later that same year. Gil had taken a raw steak from the fridge. His dad came home from work early, and Gil, who thought he had the place to himself, was standing above a picture of a female classmate, and essentially he was fucking that steak. As punishment, his dad made him eat it that night for dinner. His dad hoped that making him eat the steak he just held in his hand and fucked would cure him of, uh, you know, ever engaging again in strange sexual acts like that, but, but it didn't. It backfired. Gil was overjoyed that night at dinner. Even when his dad told him he didn't have to finish, when his dad was having trouble finishing his meal, he was getting nauseous, uh, Gil still cleaned his plate, then ran off to his bedroom with an obvious boner. Three years later, late 2000, when he was 16, female cousin was killed in a car accident, had an open casket funeral. That night after the funeral, Gil went missing. Same night, the mortician walked in on him, snacking on a finger he'd removed from his cousin while he was eating it, beaten off. Mortician called his parents instead of the police. Probably should have called the police. Now his parents very worried. And they'd soon would, uh, worry quite a bit more. During the summer of 2001, when Gil was 17, his parents, hearing strange noises at night, smelling a strange odor, went up to the attic where Gil had hidden a Coleman propane camping grill, caught him starting to cook a local homeless woman who he was masturbating on while he was trying to bite off one of her toes. Instead of going to the police, they gave her 100 bucks, made Gil pinky swear not to do creepy shit like that anymore. But then two nights later, his dad woke up to Gil biting into his mom's calf while masturbating. Does anyone still believe what I'm saying about his childhood? None of that was true. Uh, we don't have a lot of info about his childhood. He hasn't given us a lot, but I feel like that stuff at least happened in his mind. Similar things. Probably got a bit carried away with the uh, fake cannibal development there. But the internet says that uh, uh, he had a, a sibling, uh, a brother named Daniel. Gil references having a younger brother in his memoir. Doesn't name him uh, that I can find. Guess it's Daniel. 
really don't know anything about him other than he was around. Uh, in this memoir that Gill published in February of 2017, the only really place you can find details about his childhood, Raw Deal, the untold story of NYPD's cannibal cop. And yes, that's really the title. Uh, Gill shares insights into how he started heading down the path to becoming the cannibal cop. He wrote, I grew up in a quiet, safe neighborhood in Queens, New York, where for the most part, nothing ever happened. In my childhood, there were a lot of trips to theme parks. I had plenty of friends. I was popular in school. I got good grades, played a whole lot of baseball. My parents didn't get along all that well, though. There were uh, very rare instances I can think of where my parents were able to get along like normal husband and wife. Most of the time they were fighting. The rule of thumb was that if they weren't arguing about something, they weren't talking at all. They separated in 1989 when I was five years old. For much of my elementary school days, I was incredibly shy. My shyness extended to girls. As a kid, I was really into baseball. We had one of those Dwight Gooden pitching machines in the apartment when I was three years old. Oh, Dwight Gooden. Uh, My father would put a wiffle ball into the machine and it would fire a pitch at me. While my father was at work, before I started school, my mother would take me to the park with the bat and wiffle ball and pitch to me. I was hooked. They passed out flyers one day in second grade, encouraging us to sign up for Forest Hills Little League. I showed it to my father when I got home and he signed me right up. For the rest of my school career, baseball was a big thing for me. I was a natural and was good right away. With success came pressure though. Not only was I hard on myself, but my dad was hard on me. Just as I didn't want to disappoint him with academics, I didn't want to disappoint him on the field. Unfortunately, the older and better I got, the more pressure I felt. There were times I prayed the ball wouldn't be hit to me, so I wouldn't have the chance to screw it up. Uh, Gil also added that his, uh, both his parents, after their separation, were heavily involved in his life. His dad took him to a lot of Yankees games. Uh, he loved it. I don't know why he got him that. Uh, Dwight Gooden pitching machine if he was a Yankees fan. Uh, his mom doted on him. He wasn't abused, didn't suffer any head injuries. No one ever recommended he uh, you know, see a counselor for any serious issues. You know, Very normal childhood. Very good childhood, actually. Nevertheless, he soon gets pretty kinky. When he was around 11, Gil mentioned getting sexual feelings for the first time. He wrote, I started getting turned on by bondage and S&M stuff. I don't have a stunning revelation about why this happened. I didn't choose it. It was just there. I would see images or video clips on TV or in a movie of women being tied up and helpless, and I would get turned on. It excited me. Someone's sexual orientation is what the professionals in the field call fixed. In other words, if you are gay, you don't simply choose to be gay. If you get turned on by feet, it isn't like you just woke up one day and decided that feet were your thing. And if you get hard when you see a woman tied up on a platter, then there is not a whole lot you can do to change that. I've done a lot of reading about sexuality and paraphilias over the past few years. A major misconception is that people who have a fetish choose to be aroused by that. And that if a person has an odd fetish, he or she must have some kind of moral problem. That's not how it works. And he is right. Uh, I watched a 2015 documentary about all this on HBO. Uh, and, I, and I've researched this kind of stuff before, but this, this uh, documentary, Thought Crimes, The Case of the Cannibal Cop, several experts on it spoke at length about we you know, still really don't know why certain things turn us on. They just do. There doesn't seem to have to be any trauma associated with certain extreme kinks like a cannibalism fetish. It's not a choice. How strange, right? Why are we attracted to what we are uh, attracted to? Like I love skirts combined with boots or skirts combined with high heels. I love the pinup look, right? It's my favorite. Kind of Betty Page look, you know? I prefer uh, long hair to short hair. Not always. I love fishnet stockings, high heels, crotches, panties, fishnet bodysuits, black lingerie, lots of straps, garter belt straps, waist harnesses. I also love a sexy uh, woman in a man's t-shirt with nothing else on. Love seeing nipples pushing up uh, against the shirt. Love uh, a wet t-shirt draped over a woman's body, right? Don't like pantyhose at all. Huge turnoff. Do not like socks. Uh, unless they're thigh high gym socks. Another huge turnoff. Love a woman's bare feet. Uh, don't like them in socks. Don't care about bikinis. No matter how sexy the body is in them. Don't like uh, pink lingerie generally. Uh, zero sexual interest in a man's body. Watching porn with two guys and one woman does nothing for me. Huge turnoff. Why? Why do I find women's sexy uh, Halloween costumes so sexy? What's going on there, Lucifina? Why do I like the, the girl next door look, but not the typical porn star look at all? No clue. I've never really tried to analyze it. I just uh, love that my wife does it for me uh, big time and also likes what I like. I don't understand all of her fantasies. Uh, neither does she as far as like, where do they come from? It's all so odd. Sex is such a big part of our lives. And in some ways we know so little about sexuality. When Gil says he just happens to be turned on by thoughts of women in bondage slash cannibalism fantasy scenarios, I do believe him. However, to use a music analogy, research does show that while you may not pick the genre you're into that you enjoy, you can end up liking new bands that initially were too extreme for you. Thanks to, for example, watching more and more extreme porn. Everyone's different. 
Same porn that did it for me when I was 16 still does it, right? Thank you, Lucifina. My tastes have not changed over time. Why? I don't think it has anything to do with my choices or morality. I think in this regard, I just got lucky. I don't seem to have an addictive brain, right? I don't have a thrill seeker's brain, uh, which is also why I don't worry about a certain amount of drug use. Uh, I, I can drink every night for a month and then not drink at all the next month and not care, feel fine. Uh, I've never felt pulled towards gambling or felt a compulsion towards any risky behavior, really. Like I've committed risky behavior, but the risk part of it, that's not part of the fun for me. It doesn't do anything for me. I'm not an adrenaline junkie in that way. Other people are, and they seem to have been born that way. Some people who maybe are predisposed to more traditionally addictive behavior, right? Feel a strong compulsion to keep uh, pushing the envelope, to feel the same euphoria, same adrenaline rush, same dopamine rush, right? Maybe uh, maybe they uh, like to cliff dive. Maybe the first time they dove uh, off a cliff that was 10 foot, feet high and it really scared them. It was exciting. Then after doing that for a while, it became boring. Now they find a cliff that's 20 feet high and that's exciting. But after a while, that becomes boring. So they find a cliff, that, you know, it's 30 feet high. You get it. Now take that mind and put porn in front of it. Maybe initially they're turned on by basic light bondage porn, but over time that gets boring. Then they find new porn that's more hardcore. The woman has bruises after being spanked. That provides a different rush. The same rush they felt for the more tame stuff earlier, but no longer do. Then that gets boring. Uh, Then there's new porn where the woman's skin is broken and bleeding. She's choked unconscious instead of some light choking. Now it's a rush to fantasize about that. It gets more and more intense the more and more you feed it and you do choose to feed it or not. According to some recent studies on porn consumption, Most porn consumers get bored with scenes once they've seen them through a psychological process called habituation. Multiple viewings generally result in less response, not more thanks to desensitization. And desensitization, and in this instance, uh, referring to a numbed pleasure response, the inability to achieve the same high that the consumer once did, right? Desensitization results from too much dopamine, so-called pleasure chemical. Your brain generates different amounts of it in response to different experiences. From kissing to looking at something beautiful to eating a great meal. Dopamine's your body's way of telling you this is fucking awesome. We should do this more often. Hey, Lucifina. Certain activities like drug use and porn consumption turn up your brain's dopamine production in some cases as high as it can go. The more time you spend at that elevated level, the more your brain's dopamine receptors, the parts of the brain that respond to dopamine start to, so to speak, plug their ears. Think of them to use the analogy provided in an article on uh, fightthenewdrug.com, a great fucking website about how dangerous porn could be, uh, as little referees becoming more and more oblivious to complaining players and screaming fans. In a pair of interesting studies that were replicated with both men and women, college students were hooked up to instruments that measured their arousal and interest and were then shown the same pornographic scenes multiple times, right? Over and over again in a row. Arousal interest for both men and women, initially very high, then habituation quickly set in, interest level of arousal waned dramatically. Then after many viewings, right as the subject's boredom was reaching maximum levels, the researchers suddenly, without warning, switched to a brand new pornographic film, right? Bam, arousal interest level immediately shot right back up to where they were before. This phenomenon is often referred to as the Coolidge effect. Pretty sure we've talked about this a few times in the past. The Coolidge effect has been demonstrated time and time again in all sorts of research settings. Put a male and a female of just about any type of animal together, they will mate and mate and then get bored with each other. But replace one of them with a new partner, and even if they're exhausted from mating with the previous one, they will attempt to mate again. We are often driven towards sexual novelty. Researchers have surmised that this is because we are driven by a deep biological need to reproduce as often as possible. What this means is that, uh, you know, the porn consumer wants not just more porn, but new porn. That can be new people to look at, new imaginary partners to imagine having sex with, new situations, but also sometimes, and I think this is definitely obviously the case with Gil, People are uh, compelled to find more extreme situations, right? And as luck would have it, the internet has the most extreme situations you can imagine if you look hard enough for them. Porn consumers can end up being drawn over time to porn that's more secret, more shocking, more taboo, more shameful. In one 2016 study, researchers found that 46.9% of respondents reported that over time, they began watching pornography that had previously disinterested or even disgusted them. Within that 46.9%, some people are going to be more turned on than others by sexual imagery that once disgusted them. Some will seek out more extreme porn. They'll go further down the rabbit hole, just like some people with drugs, you know, maybe tap out with weed or molly. Others end up shooting up heroin, doing speedballs. I think based on the things that Gil said in interviews about starting off with bondage, but then later spending a lot of time online looking at porn, so much time finding more and more hardcore porn that eventually, and eventually cannibalism porn, this is what happened to him. He's one of the people who end up pushing further and further into what is the most taboo. And also with him, and I'll talk about this more going forward, 
he just spent so much time, so much time looking at porn and no time having real world sexual experiences. And I think that combo in particular, not, not sure if it's been studied. I am talking on my ass here a little bit, but based on other things I've looked at and just my gut, I think that is the, that's the most dangerous combination when you're not having a real life partner reminding you of what sex is, is like in the real world. And you're just constantly looking at fantasies over and over actors who they don't even necessarily do this in real life. And that becomes what you're into, you know, and you just keep taking it further and further and further. Terrible combination. Uh, back to Gil now, writing his memoir. There were three girls I was seriously attracted to in junior high. When I masturbated and thought about them, I would imagine them tied up. They would never be naked, just wearing a school uniform or maybe a bathing suit. They might struggle a bit. They might be quiet and lie there, but they were always tied up. Then I discovered America online. Almost immediately, I got into the internet and all it had to offer. It was love at first sight. I started to get into the whole chat and instant message thing and would on occasion chat with random strangers in public chat rooms. I soon realized that I could say whatever I wanted and be whoever I wanted. I would get in chat rooms and talk to girls when I could. Like most kids my age, my discovery of the internet led to my first experiences with porn. I don't remember the first porn I looked at, but just like what was going on with my head, I was mostly interested in pictures of women in bondage. I would get way more excited seeing a hot woman tied up with a gag in her mouth, even if she had clothes on, than looking at the same hot woman naked and unrestrained. For a kid, the sites I found seemed kind of wild, but looking back on it, these sites were really vanilla bondage sites, and so were the pictures I looked at. They weren't violent or particularly sadistic, just women naked and tied up, hog-tied, tied down to a bed, things of that nature. If I saw a picture I liked, I would think about a girl I knew and I would imagine her in that situation. Everyone remembers the first person they fell in love with. For me, it was in late autumn of the year 2000 when I was 16. Her name was Melanie and boy, did I fall hard. She told me early on that she wasn't interested in a boyfriend. She also told me she was interested in hanging out. That began the beginning of my confusion around her. I wanted to kiss her, but it didn't happen. In fact, it never did. Melanie would have my heart for much of the next nine years, but not one time did we ever kiss. Ah, oh, this motherfucker was so delusional. I did, however, fantasize about her countless times over the years and kissing didn't have a whole lot to do with what I was thinking about. I would think uh, about her being helpless, tied up and gagged. As time went on and I began to look at more violent pornography, things got worse for Melanie in my fantasies. Uh, he never talks about being mad at her in real life, but as far as rejected, but I, maybe she's not ready to deal with it. I strongly believe that's what was going on here. In my mind, she was an often, often in all sorts of peril, including being abducted by others to be cooked and eaten. She became my favorite girl to beat off to. Her resisting made her more attractive. And so it begins, right? Gil not developing real life sexual experiences while also conditioning himself to come to extreme sexual fantasies he's feel, feeling through fetish porn. And he's choosing to fantasize about a girl who is consistently romantically rejecting him. And I, I would imagine developing some real misogynistic thoughts, some real anger towards women with all this. I think this combination really fucked him up. 2002, Gil graduates from Archbishop Malloy High School, a Catholic co-ed prep school in Queens. Archbishop Malloy's academic program, very competitive. It was named as one of 96 most outstanding American high schools by U.S. World News Report in 1999, as well as an exemplary school by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, Ray, a lot of famous people have come out of here. Ray Romano, everybody loves Raymond. He graduated from that school in 1975. A lot of uh, current former NBA players went to school there. Fellow comic and podcaster Chris Distas, uh De Stefano, oh my God, Chris De Stefano, Jesus Christ, graduated the same year as Gil. Uh, Chris and I were buddies. I would have uh, hit him up, I'm guessing he at least knows of him. Gil was a, a good student at a great school. When he talks, when he writes, you can tell he's a smart guy. Back in 2002, he's a smart guy with a porn habit. He was hiding even from friends who openly talked about their porn consumption. Before leaving high school, he'd already developed what seemed to be a bit of a porn addiction that he was ashamed of. He had a secret he didn't want to talk about, didn't seek counseling. He was already craving darker and darker porn featuring images of women who appeared to be in more and more pain. After high school, he went to the University of Maryland in College Park, just north of D.C. In 2006, Gil will graduate from the University of Maryland with a double major, psychology and criminal justice. Uh, Janelle Corliss graduated with Valley from the University of Mar Maryland that same year. The two were in uh, some uh, same classes. Corliss later told reporters she remembered Valley sometimes making misogynistic jokes. Uh-huh. And playing up the stereotype about the angry New Yorker. He was. He was a fucking angry incel. Uh, she said he came off kind of hostile, but in a joking way. Uh, maybe not joking. Uh, Gil said that he became overwhelmed with how many attractive women were on campus. Uh-huh. So many over, so many attractive women, and none of them wanted to fuck him, and he's mad. He fantasized about gagging and hog-tying them, having violent sex with them. Uh, I find it interesting that by the end of college, he still has not had sex ever. 
uh, or, or even did anything more than just like light kissing. Never had an actual girlfriend, just a, just a few drunken kiss sessions. His sexual fantasies that he still tells no one about, they're still not being tempered by reality ever. Yee. Very dysfunctional sexual life. While studying at the University of Maryland, uh, he first discovers fetish porn uh, devoted to cannibalism, uh, a site called Mookie's Kitchen. The site is still active, pretty vanilla compared to what Gil will later fantasize about. Uh, I was able to look into it. A woman tied up, uh, but not being abused with maybe like a butt plug in, apple in her mouth, no dude around, just uh, just her in the picture, oil all over her body like she's a basted turkey, laying inside a big prop oven. It's honestly kind of laughable to me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, whatever, if you're into whatever, does nothing for me. Uh, kind of cartoonish. Doesn't, doesn't seem abusive at least. That shouldn't look scared. Uh, Gil quickly gravitates into more hard, uh, you know, finds more hardcore shit. The website, uh, used to have a related link section. And one of the links was for a site called Dolset Girls Forum. It was a message board where users would share pictures and write fictional fetish stories. Gil said that some of these pics and stories were gory and involved fantasies of kidnapping, cooking, non-consensual victims. One user's catchphrase was, it's as easy as ABC, abduction, bondage, cannibalism. Yee. Now he's jerking off the thoughts of cooking up his classmates on a regular basis. He said uh, he would fantasize about girls he found attractive, getting kidnapped, getting tied up, told they were going to be cooked and eaten. And these fantasies, he's not the one doing uh, all this to them. Not yet. Right after graduating, Gil gets a job at the New York City Police Department. Great for a mind like his. Uh, assigned to the 26th precinct, precinct in Morningside Heights, Manhattan. Set on a hill above the Upper West Side, the neighborhood of Morningside Heights, alternatively uh, described as a part of Harlem, south of Harlem, west of Harlem, its own neighborhood. So if I call it Harlem later, as many sources do, that's why. Uh, He'll score 99% on his NYPD entrance exam. Also moves in with his mom, moves back home, doesn't date, fucking scary. Continues to be an angry incel. When he's not working, not arresting bad guys, he's hanging out in his childhood room, jerking off to mostly cannibal porn. Jerking off to imagine women he knows in real life being kidnapped, raped, cooked, eaten. What a fucking life. Uh, this delusional motherfucker not dating at all for the first two years on the force. Uh, still holding on to a fantasy that Melanie, the friend he had in high school who made it clear she did not like him, who never kissed him, right? Uh, doesn't want to be more than friends with him. Still uh, holding on to some weird fantasy uh, about things maybe working out there or at least uh, kidnapping, uh, you know, raping, eating, killing her. Ay, ay, ay. Sometimes in a way, I do feel sorry for this dude. There's, there's, there's not being good with women and there's Gil Valley. He was really bad at picking up on cues, really bad at dating. <laughs> My God, before he, uh, you know, spent time in prison and lost his job on the force uh, and was labeled as the cannibal cop. I uh, can only imagine how hard dating is for him now. They would stop with the fucking porn. Your fantasy, real life experience ratio, way out of whack. Too much whacking. Not enough fucking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, 2009, Gil finally starts dating, kind of, at the age of 25. He's been steadily jerking off to cannibal porn for five, six years now. Still hasn't had a girlfriend. Still a virgin. Uh, Gil starts dating uh, by creating an eHarmony account. Goes out with five or six women. Hits it off with none of them. Uh, They don't like him. Doesn't sound like he kissed any of them. Uh, Not trying to keep picking on him for this shit, by the way, but it just provides important insight into his psychology. What's going on in his head? He is jerking off every night to cannibal porn. A lot. But he can't bring himself to try and kiss a woman in real life. That's not good. Very, very not good. Should have taken the money he was able to save by living at home with mom and started to work with a therapist. Uh, also in 2009, Gil starts visiting the Dark Fetish Network, DFN. That site's still around. It's Dark Fetish Network or DFN, a social network with nearly 50,000 purported users. Members use aliases, share photos, tell stories to one another as a sort of group fantasy exercise. The homepage displays a disclaimer stating that everything discussed on DFN is not real. This place is about fantasies only, so play safe. But of course, the anonymity of the members makes it impossible to know the true intentions of any given person on this site. Gil signs on initially as Girl Meat Hunter, wins praise from some other members after contributing to the group chats, starts IMing directly with some members, exchanging emails for offline volleys. In particular, over email, Gil will later connect in 2011 with three men who will become known as his co-conspirators. A 22-year-old car mechanic from southern New Jersey named Michael Van Eyes, a British man Valley knew as Moody Blues, whom the FBI identified as Dale Bollinger. Oh man, well, this guy's such a piece of shit. Someone who used the username Ali Khan, uh, apparently logging on from Pakistan, not known much, or they don't know much about his true identity. Gil starts uploading pics of women he knows, pics he gets from Facebook. He's writing kidnapping, bondage, rape, cannibalism fantasies about them. Not naming them, not yet. Still living at home. 
uh, sets up another online dating profile on OkCupid okay now and meets his future wife, Kathleen Mangan. After a few messages, they go out on a date, October 10th. Dinner at a place called Bistro 1018. It's still there. Gil orders the scared blonde co-ed, gagged and bound and stuck in an oven set to 425 degrees. Kathleen says she'll just have a glass of water, doesn't want to have anything in her system when she demands later that evening that Gil sodomize her with a turkey baster before giving her a gravy enema and filling her pussy with homemade stuffing before grilling her and fucking eating her. Or he has chicken and pasta and she has a lobster bisque and they share some creme brulee for dessert. Uh, then they want to go to the movies, watch Couples Retreat with Vince Vaughn. Then Kathleen gives Gil a passionate kiss and says goodnight and hot damn, he's excited. He is so turned on. He goes home and by me and by home, I mean his mom's house and he climbs into his childhood bed and he uh, beats off to thinking about Kathleen being chloroformed, kidnapped by a pair of killers, stripped naked, laid on a platter to be eaten with an apple in her fucking mouth. Not kidding. That is literally what he said he did. Oh my God, I realize that may have sounded like more of my bullshit. Nope. They go on a few more dates, have some makeout sessions. And then finally, this guy loses his virginity before he turns 26. And now he's all in. At long last, he has found a warm living place other than his right palm to thrust his hard cannibal oven cock in and out of. Soon he wants to marry Kathleen. Of course he does. She's the first woman who has shown him any sort of sexual attention. A woman who has no idea. He's beaten off to thinking about her being roasted in an oven. You know? How could this possibly not end in happily ever after? To Kathleen, Gil seems like a cheerful cop at a precinct in West Harlem. A sweet boy. A sweet mama's boy. Such good manners. Old fashioned. Barely ever talks about biting her tits off. Uh, the young elementary school teacher who had studied at Gonzaga University, go Zags, falls in love. I wonder if she lived in the uh, same dorms I did. Interesting connection for me to this story. Uh, first, they moved to their apartment, uh, first apartment together, one bedroom on 88th Street and 3rd Avenue. By that time, Gil has already began to upload pictures of Kathleen now to the Dark Fetish Network. She, of course, has no idea. And they get a pet, a bulldog named Dudley, because Kathleen loves the Gonzaga Bulldogs. They train Dudley together, take turns walking him. Kathleen will later remember these early years fondly. Saying it was fun. We laughed together. It was nice. He opened doors, pulled out chairs. Things changed in January of 2011 when she got pregnant. Gil had a good run. He had a solid 12 to 13 months of sexual activity with one person before, uh, you know, becoming a father to be. Actually, Kathleen will later say that their sex, his sex drive began to wane before she got pregnant. Gil will complain later that their sex was too vanilla. Well, yeah, you dumb fuck. Of course, for him, it's too vanilla. She could have let him uh, dip his balls in her ass while she dressed up in a chicken suit, uh, let him come all over her face after her best friend uh, sucked his dick, and he'd probably be like, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was that was kind of hot. That was a little bit kinky. But you still won't even try letting me violently rape you and then put you in a really hot oven and cut you up and maybe eat a little bit of you or something. I mean, when you keep coming to fantasies that dark that involve torture, rape, murder, cannibalism, how can real-life sex ever compare i hate how ridiculously delusional just unrealistic just fucking stupid some people choose to be uh when he first heard the news of kathleen getting pregnant valley said i can't do this before salvaging the moment calling her parents to assure them that he would do the right thing but he never seemed to fully adjust right because now it's real life now it's, it's not a fantasy so he starts to drift away kathleen remembered that he didn't seem that interested in fatherhood sometimes seemed downright miserable still in preparation for the baby they moved to a bigger apartment a two bedroom and four stills In late September 2011, Kathleen gives birth to their child, a little girl named Josephine. Gil, more active on DFN than ever. His former brief real-world sex life, now almost non-existent. The baby now the priority. Kathleen quits teaching. Full-time is a full-time mom. Gil works a lot of hours, quite a bit of overtime. Spends some time with the baby and his wife. Doesn't seem super interested. When they go to bed, he'll log into DFN and chat with other users about, you know, fucking torturing his wife, eating her, raping her, doing the same shit to his old crush, Melanie, and other women he knows. January of 2012, Gil emails DFN buddy Michael Van Nuys, uh, emails him photos of Alicia Friska, a friend of Kathleen's who taught at the school where she once worked. Gil offers to kidnap her uh, for this guy for $5,000. Van Nuys replies, uh, can we do it for four? Gil responds, I'm putting my neck on the line here. If something goes wrong, somehow I'm in deep shit. $5,000 and you need to make sure that she is not found. She will definitely make the news. In chats happening about the same time with Ali Khan, uh, Gil suggests taking Kathleen on a trip to India where the two of them will kill her and prepare her for dinner. He writes, we will take turns with her after sending a photo of his wife in a bikini to this guy. Also discussed killing Andrea Noble, one of Gil's college friends, a girl he had a crush on who wanted, like most women, nothing to do with him romantically because they probably picked up on how fucking weird he is. Uh, Gil wrote, it's personal with Andrea. She will absolutely suffer. 
Later, he added that he found a recipe for chloroform online, saying, I'm in the middle of constructing a pulley apparatus in my basement to string her up by her feet. On Valentine's Day 2012, Gil proposes to Kathleen at an Italian restaurant in Queens, uh, Il Toscano. She accepts. Nine months after the birth of their daughter, Gil and Kathleen get married June 19th, 2012 on the campus of Gonzaga. Uh, While Kathleen remembered the wedding being nice, the marriage that followed was not. Gil rarely helps with the baby now. When he comes home after midnight from the precinct, she uh, usually is not up any longer. Uh, Sex, when it happens at all, very rare, never ends well. Apparently, Gil cannot finish. He'll run to the bathroom and finish there, right? Doesn't talk about this in his memoirs. I found that interesting. Have to assume he was ashamed of not being able to achieve orgasm through real sex, only through focusing on images related to extreme cannibalistic fantasies. Soon he begins to avoid her almost completely. And instead of trying to seduce her, he'll play video games or watch TV until she falls asleep, you know, uh, when he's not working super late, which is rare. And then he goes on the internet, you know, until three, four, five in the morning by his own admission. At this point, he's mostly chatting with his uh, DFN buddy, Moody Blues. And what are they chatting about? Bragging that his oven is big enough for uh, a victim to fit in if he folds her legs. Mentioning that if he uh, has a place up, that he has a place up in the mountains where he can bring a woman of their choice. For this mountain fantasy, the two men settle on Kimberly Sauer, a college friend of Gil's. Gil starts planning the details, writing, Once she's dead, I'll take her out and properly butcher her body and cook the meat right away. And that could be out on a rotisserie, too. Gil later emailed Moody Blues a short word document titled Abducting and Cooking Kimberly, a blueprint. All right, he lists materials he'll need to do the job, a car, chloroform, uh, you know, refer to website for directions, rope, a gag, duct tape tarp or plastic bags to protect the trunk from DNA remains. More bags for Kimberly Sauer's clothes, uh, cheap sneakers. Meanwhile, Kathleen has finally grown suspicious about all the time Gil is spending online. When they're up together, you know, she'll find that her husband's surfing websites like ESPN, Major League Baseball, The Rant, a message board for NYPD cops. He tells her he's visiting these same sites when she's asleep, but she's having her doubts. Then one day late in the summer of 2012, she notices that he is erasing his search history. Not long after that, only several months into their marriage, she learns what he's really looking at. She opened their Mac and saw that he hadn't logged out of his account. She noticed that there were two little files uh, on the computer, the, on the bottom of the like browser. She clicks on them, little downloads. Uh, there were image files. And while the pictures themselves didn't load, she was able to see the URL where they had come from, the Dark Fetish Network. She looks it up. She's immediately disturbed. She knows there's porn on the internet, right? That uh, bondage porn, of course, as well. The recent Fifty Shades of Grey series had hit the mainstream, but this is different. Uh, For starters, the girl on the homepage of this website looks like she's dead. Until that moment, Kathleen had just thought that if she were prettier, if she, uh, you know, cleaned and cooked more, maybe Gil would want her uh, sexually again. Now she's not so sure. She tells Gil they need to talk. She asks him if uh, that was uh, what he wanted, if she should go shopping for some sex toys, maybe. She must not have seen the images I found uh, yet. When I did a little image search for dark fetish network uh, photos, badly photoshopped images, which was actually uh, somewhat comforting to me to know that they're not real, but still seriously fucked up shit. Like women tied up, having their breasts cut off, uh, Ripper Crew style, women having their throats slit, being decapitated uh, while being fucked, you know, looking terrified while being tortured and killed in a variety of, you know, crazy ways. Women who are crying, look like they're being raped, being cooked, eaten, hanged with rope around their necks. Women with what looked like arrows being shot into their assholes. The whole section of snuff porn. And this is the stuff I could just access easily without a membership. Had she seen, uh, the, you know, the images that he was looking at, I think she would have ran at this point. This shit was a long ways from Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, Gil seems frightened at first when Kathleen confronts him about this. Yeah, probably because he was like thinking that she saw the, the hardcore shit. But then relieved and enthusiastic for the first time since before she, uh, you know, uh, gotten pregnant. Kathleen is hopeful their sex life will improve. She thought they were on the verge of a breakthrough, that Gil was finally going to be honest with her, but uh, he's not. And their sex life, after a a tiny, brief resurgency where he still has to go come in the bathroom, virtually unchanged, right? Because he has fucking ruined his brain with his extreme fetish obsession with watching fucking so much porn, hours and hours and hours, writing these stories, hours, ugh. On and around uh, May 31st, 2012, Gil Valley does something that's definitely illegal now. As an NYPD officer, he has access to Omnix Force Mobile, OFM, a computer program that allows officers to search various restricted databases, including the Federal National Crime Information Center database, which contains sensitive information about people, like their home addresses and birthdays. The NYPD's policy known to go was that these databases could only be accessed in the course of an officer's official duties, and then accessing them for personal use violated the department rules. 
His sexual fantasies have led him now to uh, abusing his position, to risking his job. That day in May, Gill accused the, uh, or not, not accused, sorry, accessed the OFM, searched for Maureen Hardigan, a woman he'd known since high school, a woman he'd been discussing uh, kidnapping with Ali Khan. This would definitely put a hole in what Gilbert would later claim in his trial, that his fantasies had no bearing on his personal life or uh, affected him professionally. Well, if they didn't affect him professionally, why is he looking up this information at work? Two months later, July 22nd, 2012, Gil sees Kimberly Sauer, a woman he had talked about kidnapping with Moody Blues at a brunch during a weekend trip to visit old friends from the University of Maryland and goes online and tells his new friends about it later. He wrote, she looked absolutely mouthwatering. I could hardly contain myself. August 24th, Gil and his friends discuss kidnapping another woman, Christine Ponticelli, an 18-year-old recent graduate of Valet's old high school where she was a star, star softball player. Next day, they move on to talk about kidnapping Andrea Noble. He writes, if Andrea lived near me, she'd be gone by now. Even if I get caught, she'd be worth it. Even though he's talking about kidnapping women he knows in real life constantly now, he hasn't actually prepared anything though. No large, no oven, excuse me, large enough for a human, no cleaver, no homemade chloroform. Prosecutors would find out later there was no uh, house in the mountains either, right? It's all make-believe. Uh, you know, he knew the identities of the people he was, uh, uh, or, or excuse me. And he also did not know the real life identities of the people he was talking to online. Also never gave out the last names of any of the people he shared photos, uh, of or their addresses. When Moody Blue specifically requested an address at one point, Gil turned him down. Was he, uh, biding his time or really just fantasizing? Meanwhile, Kathleen beginning to get suspicious again, even though she and Gil had to talk about his sexual fantasies previously, she couldn't get, uh, some of the images she had seen out of her head. For his part, Gil didn't seem relieved or excited the way, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, she uh, hoped. It just seemed suspicious. Uh, on September 9th, 2012, she installed spyware on the computer, a uh, computer that they shared. The next day, September 10th, Kathleen sees all the websites Valley is still visiting. Darkfetishnet.com, uh, girlsinabind.com, fetlife.com. Way more upsetting. She sees her name in horrific instant message chats. When she clicks to open these chats, she sees pictures of herself, pictures of her friends, pictures of people she and Gil knew, pictures of coworkers. She used to, you know, former coworkers with first names attached now with measurements, uh, descriptions. She enters her name in a search of Valley's email. What she sees overwhelms her. One email from one of Gil's correspondents said that Kathleen was going to be tied up by her feet and have her throat slit. And then they'd all have fun watching the blood gush out of her. The guy wrote, if she cries, don't listen to her. Don't give her mercy. And then Gil replies, it's okay. We'll just gag her. Frightened for her life now, she books a flight to her parents in Nevada, taking their baby daughter with her. Days later, she logs into the spyware program again, finds a trove of S&M images of women being tortured and sexually assaulted, kind of shit I described earlier. Sees records of Google searches for stuff like how to kidnap women, human meat recipes. Opens files with pictures of more than 80 women he has downloaded from Facebook and other sources. In email conversations, he reads passages where Gil discusses various ways he wants to kidnap, rape, kill, cook these women, including her. Right, there's a, a, yeah, Gil's supervisor at the 26th Precinct is one of these women, that teenage girl who just barely graduated from his old high school. Uh, about one of these women, he writes, I'll be eyeing her from head to toe, licking my lips, longing for the day I cram a chloroform-soaked rag in her face. From Nevada, Kathleen hands over her, or her laptop to the FBI now, along with keys to her Forest Hills Queens apartment, permission for them to seize her older laptop that Gil is using. It was then that the feds uncovered the extent of Gill's fantasies, or according to them, his plans. Searching through Gill's computer, investigators learned the six-year NYPD vet had attempted to contact potential victims, including one of his wife's former co-workers, an elementary school teacher in Harlem, to find out more about their jobs and routines. Like Kathleen, they saw the Google searches. Gill had been uh, looking up the uh, best rope to tie someone with, information on white slavery, how to make chloroform, recipes for human flesh. My God, right? I, I try not to kink shame, but... This shit is fucked up. Call me approved, but if I found a bunch of shit on Lindsay's computer about her being so turned on by the thought of her kidnapping me, tying me up, torturing me, having my throat slit, having me raped by other people, having me cooked, eaten, that is a big problem. <laughs> That's a deal breaker. That's terrifying. October 21st, 2012, the feds make their move. Fearing that he is planning to carry out the plan very soon, the FBI arrests Gill shortly after 2 p.m. They use a, lure, a ruse to lure him out into the hallway. Calling his house phone, saying that his car parked outside had just been hit. He wanders out in a t-shirt and jeans. The second he sees these uh, officers, he understands. An agent places a hand on his shoulder and says, everything's going to be okay. <laughs> Gil looks at him, shakes his head and says, I don't think so. Yeah, Gil's right. Federal prosecutor Hadassah Waxman says Valley had communicated with three co-conspirators about his plans to commit a crime and at one point used a police car 
while dressed in uniform to conduct surveillance of a woman who he approached in an intimidating fashion. Approached in an intimidating fashion while at work, right? While in uniform, while in his squad car. What a ridiculous abuse of his position in law enforcement. Was he just fantasizing? Sure seems like shit was escalating. Uh, U.S. attorney Preet Bahara said Valley's alleged plans to kidnap women so that they could be raped, tortured, killed, cooked, and cannibalized shocked the conscience. Valley is arraigned before U.S. magistrate judge Henry Pittman, charged with conspiring to kidnap women with three others. Two of the co-conspirators live overseas and illegally accessing the National Crime Information Database to research one of his targeted victims. And in no time, Gil now has a tabloid nickname, the Cannibal Cop. Preparing their case against him, the FBI singles out emails in which he strategizes how he'd do it, negotiates fees for kidnappings. They scan his work-related computer searches. Meanwhile, Gil's put in solitary confinement for his own protection. As a cop, they're worried he might be targeted by other inmates. His third day at the uh, Metropolitan Correctional Center in Lower Manhattan, Hurricane Sandy hits New York. Prison lights blink out for several minutes, and the cell block goes on lockdown. His lawyers can't visit him. He has no communication with his family. He doesn't know uh, that there's been a storm. He's scared and confused. Other prisoners were let out for an hour every day for recreation. Gil doesn't get that time, again, for his protection. So he's spending every hour of every day by himself, less the time for morning showers on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. For months, he's not permitted to make phone calls. After that, he gets one 15-minute conversation every 30 days. When he falls asleep, he's dreaming of being a patrol car or being with his daughter or, I don't know, kidnapping women he knows, binding them, gagging them, torturing, raping them, cooking them, and eating them. Guessing he's passing a lot of the time thinking those thoughts. Probably had at least one prison guard he saw that he felt was sexy enough to uh, want to cook and eat. When he's up, he worries over who's going to pay his rent, what's going to happen to his wife and child, what his parents think of what he's done, you know, if he's going to get out. He feels angry that he's been locked up for, quote, nothing, angry at himself for having got so, gotten so involved in fetish role plays, at least that's what he would claim. Eventually, the guards take pity on him. One slips a radio into his cell so he can pass the time working on his case, uh, listening to sports talk shows or W fan or, yeah, W F A N. At one point, he overhears the guy in the next cell asking guards for more toilet paper. He uh, is so out of sorts, he's not eating. He has more toilet paper than he needs. Tells the guard he'd like to share. This gets him talking to this guy through the wall. The guy tells him that the other inmates knew about his story, knew that he'd been a cop. Also, knew newspapers had been, uh, you know, calling him the cannibal cop and uh this guy says his case sounds like it's bullshit this gives gil hope this is the first person other than his lawyer maybe his parents who's on his side uh then there's uh another person who's soon going to be on his side on the afternoon of december 31st 2012 forensic psychiatrist park Dietz travels downtown to the manhattan detention center to conduct the first of several psychiatric examinations with the cannibal cop no one on either side of the case has been uh, wanting to claim that Gill is uh, insane or going to use an insanity defense. But since the case against him revolves almost entirely around his chats, Gill's lawyers feel like they need a forensic psychiatrist to weigh in on the central question of how real his web persona is, how real it could become, right? That's what his case hinges on. Is it just fantasy or more than that? Uh, by this time, Park Dietz uh, had an all-star list of criminals he'd examined previously. John Hinckley Jr., Betty Broderick, former suck subject, R3, R3, Arthur, Genesee River, Killer Shot Cross, right? Captain Headwound, uh, Andrea Yates, Joel Rifkin, others. But even though forensic psychiatry is well used and well respected today, there's still not much psychiatrists can do when it comes to predicting people's future behavior, only their current state. Uh, Dietz already knew from Gill's NYPD psychology file that the officer had been administered the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, standard test meant to identify personality structure and detect signs of psychopathology. The MMPI showed no clinical psychopathology. Dietz also employed elements of the Static 99, one straightforward assessment geared towards predicting recidivism rates for rapists and child molesters. Shows no red flags. Doesn't seem mentally ill or to be at risk for committing uh, you know, violent crimes. But there's those emails, right? The messages, the chats. When he first reads them, Dietz honestly doesn't know what to think. He'd say, from the chats and emails, there was no way to tell. Chats and emails allow for multiple inf uh, inferences. Taken at their worst, they could be very alarming. In 18 hours of interviews with Dietz spanning three days, Valley discusses openly for the first time with another human being uh, his sex life. He starts with his traditional Catholic school childhood. Uh, says he's not inhibited or ashamed about masturbation, but he was repressed and inhibited around others, shy about approaching girls. His fantasy life took a turn. He said when in high school, he saw the film The Mask and locked in on an image of Cameron Diaz, abducted and tied up. Fucking Cameron Diaz, of course. This is all her fault. Burn the witch! Burn the witch! Lock her up! Lock her up! Sorry. Uh, Dietz learned that by the end of high school, 
Valley discovered bondage websites and in college found uh, fetish websites, like right, including Mookie's Kitchen, a campy site that specializes, as we talked about, stage cannibalism photography, pornography, women tied up on spits, apples in their mouths. He's turned on by this shit, but in real life, uh, treats women respectively, uh, never threatens anyone, um, isn't having sex until he meets Kathleen. Then he discovers DFN, starts talking about his fantasies online. Prosecutors will say uh, he is taking steps uh, from to make those fantasies a reality. But Dietz doesn't think so. He looks for something in Gil's personality or history that would make him that one in a thousand monster, but can't find it. And there's the fact that Gil doesn't cover his tracks, uh, you know, that well. If he's actually planning on committing a crime, he uses a traceable IP address, a shared computer. Wouldn't someone who planned on kidnapping and eating someone take more steps to hide their plans? Or criminally speaking, is he just a fucking idiot? Dietz doesn't think so. He'll say that Gil is the nicest guy you could ever meet. But the trial would cause some people to think very differently. Before the trial, though, the FBI has another arrest to make. January 4th, 2013, they arrest Van Eyes, one of his old chat buddies at his home in Hamilton, New Jersey. The 22-year-old admitted to the police that he had violent sexual fantasies, some involving children. But his wife, Belise, defending him as a big teddy bear, noted that she had known about his fetish before they got married. She told reporters, I was cool with it. It's disturbing, yeah but you have to accept your partner's flaws in a marriage. I'm not perfect. He's not perfect. Okay, that's some nice stuff to say. But could you accept your partner telling you that they sexually fantasize about how they, uh, how they got off to uh, thoughts of doing something like raping kids? I couldn't. It's too much for me. Fantasy or not, it's too fucking dark. I realize that very possibly this person, you know, just can't help being attracted to that. But also, I can't help being repulsed by that. What if I can't help but feel disgusted, right? Don't I have the right to be disturbed? I've been scolded before for king shaming, but don't I have the right to be disgusted by certain sexual fantasies in the same way that others have the right to have those fantasies? Just like someone deserves to be with someone else who accepts their fantasies, don't we all deserve to be with someone who doesn't have fantasies we find morally abhorrent? I think it goes both ways. Be realistic. If you have super fucked up, dark, predatory sexual fantasies, I think you're a fool to think that you're going to have an easy time finding someone who's going to accept them. Uh, Gill's trial begins February 25th, 2013. Valley faces a maximum of life in prison for the conspiracy charge and a maximum of five years in federal prison for accessing the Federal National Crime Information Center without the correct authorization to do so. The jury now feels like it's hearing two cases. One, if Gil Valley did in fact plan to kidnap someone and two, if he was likely to do something bad if he was set free. On the first point, if he was planning, we've mentioned how he stalked women for years, shared photos of his wife and other women with cannibal fetishists online, would frequently report back to his friends if he saw one of the women in person, even drafted up a kidnapping plan for Kimberly Sauer. On the other hand, never actually bought any of the things in his kidnapping plan, never rigged up an oven big enough to cook a human, never shared the women's addresses or last names online, even when Moody Blues asked. On the second point, if he was likely to do something if he went free, Park Deet seemed to think no. Thinks Gill is a nice guy with a fetish. But reading the messages and emails in court, it would be hard for the jury not to be struck by how fucking horrific they are. How much Jill genuinely seemed to want to do the things he wrote about wanting to do. Let's get into how this trial goes down now. At some point before the trial starts, the judge orders any mention of Moody Blues' more disturbing fantasies struck from the record. In particular, one about how Moody Blues wanted to eat a five-year-old kid. Uh, why? The judge notes that the transcript showed that Gill's culinary tastes uh, do not extend to kids. And the prosecution has plenty of material pertaining to the case at hand. Judge doesn't want salacious details uh, from Moody Blues, more extreme fantasies to play a role in determining the central question of the trial. Was what Gill Valley did online illegal? Judge also excluded evidence that Gill had been doing surveillance on an alleged victim's home based on cell phone tower pings, which turned out to be ambiguous. So going into the trial, Gill thinks he's likely to be set free. He thinks the prosecution's case is uh, crumbling. Then the opening statements begin. In her opening statements, his lawyer, Julia Gatto, argued his plans were pure fantasy, role-playing, with like-minded online pals, some of whom lived in other countries. Just fantasy, she stressed, similar to the kind of uh, work that Stephen King uh, does, you know, when writing a novel. Uh, but Prosecutor Randall Jackson says Gill is in the process of making his plans a reality by compiling personal information about his prey and sharing it with pals. Photos from Facebook. You know, that sort of thing. Jackson says investigators found dossiers on close to 100 female friends and acquaintances on his wife's computer, compiled with, quote, meticulous research. Make no mistake, Jackson said, Gilbert or Gilberto uh, Valley was very serious about these plans. And then it was on to the witness testimony. The first witness is Gil's wife, Kathleen, right? She describes how terrified she was when she discovered that Gil, uh, what Gil had been doing online. She described logging into Gil's account, becoming horrified by what she saw. 
She says, all of a sudden, I'm seeing pictures of myself, pictures of our friends. I was supposed to be tied by my feet, my throat slit. They were going to watch the blood rush from my body. When the federal public defender asked why she resisted efforts to speak to her husband's defense team, she shot back, you represent the man who wants to kill me. I do not want to talk to you. Then two other women, Kimberly Sauer and a high school friend, are called to the stand and testify about their seemingly normal relationship with Gil. Kimberly Sauer says Gil seemed like a totally normal friend, even texted her when his child was born. It's a baby girl, he announced. Next on the stand is a friend from Gil's days at Archbishop Malloy High School, Maureen Hartigan. She said Gil had once expressed interest in dating her, but she said she just wanted to be friends and that, uh, you know, that is what they seem to uh, remain being. She recalled that uh, Valley had texted her after he got married. He texted her again about his baby, calling her such a good baby. Uh, but in text to Maureen, Gil seemed less happy about his work as a cop, saying he looked forward to when he could retire. I'm counting down to 2026, he texted. The defense lawyer asked Hardigan if she had ever known Valley to be physically abusive with her or any other women. She said no. Both women emphasized how nice, normal, and friendly Gil was in real life. Next witness, Christine uh, Ponticelli, the 18-year-old recent graduate of Archbishop Malloy, who Gil had allegedly stalked. According to reports and emails, Kristen was referred to as the most desirable piece of meat I've ever met. She's a must-have. In later online conversation, Gil mentioned the athlete again, noting, my oven is pretty big. I can take the racks out. Prosecutors noted evidence from cell phone uh, towers indicating that Valley made calls on May 5th, 2012 that were picked up, you know, uh, six to 700 yards from Malloy High School. May 5th was a Saturday. Prosecutors believed Valley was there uh, to watch her play uh, practice softball. Gill's defense said it was just a coincidence. Was it? Next person to testify, FBI agent Corey Walsh. He read aloud emails and chats that Valley had with Moody Blues and, you know, others doing unspeakable violence to the very same women who had just been on the stand. As we covered earlier, Gil told Moody Blues he would sell one of the women to him to do with uh, her as he wished for five grand. Right? Can you have her tied barefoot? Moody Blues asked. I don't want her to kick me. With Moody Blues, Gil spoke in detail of cooking Kimberly Sauer, the same woman jurists had just seen talking about Gil and, the, and his baby on the stand. I really want her to suffer, Gil wrote. I just can't wait to get Kimberly cooking. Moody Blues asked if he'd ever eaten a black or Hispanic woman. Gil said white girls seemed to be the most appetizing to me. Moody Blues seemed at one point, or suggested at one point, that they could use the bones to make stock. Girl soup, Moody Blues said. Mm-mm, Gil said. At another point, Moody Blues stated that he preferred not to have sex with his food beforehand. Fine, Gil said. It's okay with me, but I have to tell you, she's been on my favorite. Vi- she's been one of my favorite victims to fantasize about for around 10 years now. Conversation went on, specifying about how they're going to cook her flesh, a uh, victim that was currently sitting in the courtroom. Jury members hear about another particularly chilling conversation that went like this. Gil writes, it is going to be so hard to restrain myself when I knock her out, but I'm, but I'm aspiring to be a professional kidnapper and that's business, but I will really get off, but I will really get off knocking her out, tying up her hands and bare feet and gagging her. Then she will be stuffed into a large piece of luggage and wheeled out to my van. Moody Blues writes, just make sure she doesn't die before I get her. Gil replies, no need to worry. She'll be alive. It's a short drive to you. I think I would rather not get involved in the rape you paid for. She's all yours. I don't want to be tempted the next time I abduct a girl. Then there was an online conversation. Another one Gil had with a dark fetish member that led to an MP3 being sent uh, to Gil of a very messed up song that would be played in the courtroom. Well, do you know it's the best when the poop hits your chest? That's how I come. I'll shoot my seed when your ass starts to bleed. That's how I come. That's how I come. And that user was a showbiz fish 69. Or that was another throwback to an old episode. Feeling nostalgic today. But all this cannibalism. Uh, all of this. The women's testimony, the chats read out aloud, uh, painted a damning picture of Gil Valley, right? But Julia Gatto, Valley's lawyer, was prepared for that. She argued that all this was part of a role-playing game, the collaborative version of writing a Stephen King novel. Why does she keep referring to Stephen King? He's writing about made-up characters. He's not writing himself in the story. He's not putting people he knows in real life in the story. It's not obviously. Most importantly, there's no section in the back of his fucking book with pictures of real people that he's saying horrible shit about. I uh, got notes that Gil had repeatedly made plans to kidnap a woman, but never actually did so. Over and over, supposed kidnapping days came and went. Gil never kidnapped anybody. Sometimes he went months at a time without talking to co-conspirators. When they talked again, they seemed to forget most of the details of previous conversations. Nor did Gil ever meet his co-conspirators or talk to them over the phone. 
the kidnapping plan, if it, if it existed, was only in cyberspace, in a murky place that always blended the line between fantasy and reality. Uh, Gatto said that Gil had always been aroused by unusual things and made a stupid decision to talk about them online, but that's not criminal. Moreover, Gil Valley's DFN profile page did state, I like to press the envelope, no matter what I say, it's all fantasy. The defense used videotape testimony from Sergei Marinkov, now the Russian creator of DFN. Both sides questioned Mr. Marinkov, who lived in Moscow via teleconference, and the video was played for the jury. Mr. Marinkov, who described his main job as selling Spanish ice cream, what the fuck is that? And Moscow said he created the website in 2010 because we saw a niche in the market and decided to jump in. He said the site was devoted to people with sexual fetishes, all fetishes that exist that are legal, he said. He said that users played out fantasies that included foot fetishes, sexual asphyxiation, cannibalism. He likened the site to Facebook because it afforded users private chats, groups, and the ability to push photo albums or publish photo albums. He said the DFN had about 38,000 members, including 4,500 who visited at least several times a week. He estimated that 25 to 30 percent of the users were women. The site's purpose, he said, was about fantasy only and added that he had kicked users off when, as he put it, let's say that it seemed not to be fantasy anymore. But under cross-examination by Randall Jackson, Mr. Mer- uh, Marinkoff acknowledged that there was no way to know whether users calling themselves females actually were. Uh, he said he did not monitor users' private conversations, had no way of knowing whether they were involved in illegal activities or even who they were. He said it would be like asking Mark Zuckerberg if he knows each and every user on Facebook. Of course not. Uh, it was still unclear how this was all going to play out. Uh, through, through all the testimony, Gil's parents and younger brother sat in the second row of spectators, slumped in the impossibility of finding some appropriate way to, to behave when your son appears to be a twisted cannibal. Outside court, when Pix11 asked Gil Valley Sr. how his son was doing, the father responded, he's very strong. He's holding up. I'm very proud of him. Are you? Uh, when Pix asked if he believed the charges against his son, he replied, not at all. A decision will be coming soon. Summations began March 7, 2013. During summations, Gil wept as he listened to his lawyer describe how his wife had left him because of the way he broadcast his fetish. His foolishness on the internet, his insensitive, ugly thoughts have cost him everything, Gatto said. She allowed that we should all be so, that we all should be disturbed by Valley's thoughts, but drove home the notion that those thoughts simply weren't the subject of the trial. The conversations are preposterous. They're disturbing. They're disgusting, she said. We should be upset that people are thinking these thoughts, but they're not criminal. The prosecutor, meanwhile, depicted Valley as reckless and out of control. In his summation, Randall Jackson referred back to Valley's web searches for Kristen Ponticelli's address. There's something incredibly wrong just on the fact with a New York City police officer talking about killing a high school student. And then Googling to try to get her information about her address, he said. This is a man who's trying to move a plan into action. He argued the pre-crime case. Think about your favorite restaurant. If you were to find out that the chef at that restaurant had a deep-seated fantasy of poisoning all the people in the restaurant, and that night after night he was engaging in conversations with other people about how he could poison the restaurant goers at his restaurant, that he was researching online the different poisons, that he was communicating with people the names of certain other people who come to his restaurant all the time and saying, I can't wait to see this person drop dead when they taste this cyanide filling up their throat. If you found out about that and he said, oh, this is just my fantasy, would you continue to eat at that restaurant? Of course you wouldn't. I mean, it makes a good point, but should that chef be arrested and sent to prison possibly for life for having that fantasy? Or should people just not go to the restaurant? Uh, The jury thought the chef should be imprisoned. March 12, 2013, the jury convicts Gil Valley of conspiracy to commit kidnapping and of conducting a computer search of a federal database that exceeded his authorized access. Gil shook his head as he was taken away. His mom, who'd been there every day, asked what trial were they watching as officers let him out of the court. He looked back at his family. His mom shook her head and mouthed the words, stay strong, but he wouldn't be able to follow her advice. When he got inside, he starts crying right away. Uh, uh, His mom tells, or I'm sorry, his defense attorney tells reporters, This was a thought prosecution. The jury couldn't get past the thoughts. At least one member of the jury disagreed publicly, though. Uh, Victor Pinero told reporters, we did what we did what we did in good conscience. Clearly, we believed his fantasy was going to step into reality. I think like an addict needs a larger and larger dose. He was needing things that were more and more real and he was progressing. He was bringing it into real life. Gil now has to adjust to life in prison. No longer able to endure the endless hours by himself, he asked for a move, said he didn't care if he got his ass kicked, anything was better than solitary. A prison supervisor reluctantly agreed, released Gil into the general population. When he walked in, he said everything stopped, but no one got in his face. He had to himself for a few days, started making friends after that, grew close to his cellmate, talked a lot about their kids. Turned out that uh, Valley had two competing identities in prison. He was a former cop, but also a guy who had gotten a very public raw deal 
in the eyes of other inmates from the legal system. For the other inmates, the second was more important than the first. Soon Valley had a job in the prison kitchen, only one available at the time, then got promoted to kitchen supervisor. Life was getting better behind bars, but Valley still had trouble understanding how he ended up in this predicament. He was convinced, or would say so at least, that if no one had found the chats, this would have never happened. And if he, uh, you know, would have known he'd lose everything over it, he would have never done it. Uh, well, yeah, sure, a lot of people wouldn't do what sent them to prison if they knew they'd get caught. Uh, now Gil works on his appeal and waits. April of 2013, working on information provided by Michael Van Eyes, the FBI arrests two more men who've been chatting with one another on DFN. One is Richard Meltz, a 65-year-old police chief in Bedford, Massachusetts. Others, Robert Ash, a 61-year-old former librarian at Stuyvesant High School, who in 2009 had been arrested and accused of inappropriately touching four male students, charges that were later dropped. Unlike Gill, these men's actions in the physical world were not ambiguous. Ash and Metz both met with an undercover agent, right? At the meeting, Ash brought with him a bag containing a taser, meat hammer, skewers, and a dental retractor. He was ready to torture and kidnap some woman he thought was real, right? He was prepared to make her suffer immensely and kill her. Ugh. February 10th, 2014, Gil's main online buddy, Moody Blues, aka 66, you know, year old, now 66 year old, Dale Stanley Bollinger, convicted in England of two counts of possession of child pornography, one count of attempting to meet a child following sexual grooming, seven counts of publishing, distributing, circulating, selling an obscene article of a minor. This motherfucker plotted to rape, decapitate, and eat a 14-year-old girl. Went to meet up with who he thought was this 14-year-old girl uh, to do just that, but the, you know, quote-unquote girl was an undercover agent. As of a few months ago, June 2nd, 2022, less than two years after being released from incarceration, this sick fuck and registered sex offender was living in Lincoln, Nebraska. I think it's public record. 1034 South 29th Street. When he was released, a journalist from The Mirror asked if he wanted to say sorry about his crimes in Britain, and Bollinger said, fuck off and die. This was the main guy Gil was fantasizing with, his old buddy, his old harmless pal, guy he was sharing pics of his wife with. Yeah. July 1st, 2014, federal judge Paul Gardef, or Gardefi rules that there is insufficient evidence to support Gil's original conviction and acquits the former NYPD officer of kidnapping and conspiracy charges, the most serious charges he faced. While remaining mindful of the jury's critical role in our legal system, Judge Gardefi acknowledged his responsibility to ensure that the government satisfies its burden of establishing proof beyond a reasonable doubt. In the words of Alan Dershowitz, that lawyer we met in the Epstein two-part suck, who I really do not care for, probably isn't good enough. The prosecution had to prove that Gill was making a kidnapping plan actively and going to carry it out. Judge Gardefi thought that he had not. Emphasizing the unique circumstances of this extraordinary case, he con uh, concluded that the prosecutors had failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Valley and his alleged co-conspirators had entered into a conspiracy to kidnap. Gardefi upheld Gill's uh, conviction on the charge of illegally gaining access to law enforcement databases, which carried a maximum sentence of a year, which he'd already served. So he's released from prison after serving 18 months in custody uh, after his 2012 arrest. Despite the judge's order, uh, Valley, not free quite yet, an appeal to restore the original conviction, which could earn him a life sentence still, was put into the Second Circuit, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit ruled on December 3rd, 2015, regarding two questions on appeal. The government appeals from the district court's judgment of acquittal on the conspiracy count and Valley separately appeals from the judgment of conviction on the CFAA count because we agreed that there was insufficient evidence as to the existence of a genuine agreement to kidnap and a Valley specific intent to commit a kidnapping. We affirm the district court's judgment of acquittal on the conspiracy count because we find the district court's construction of the CFAA violates the rule of lenity. Uh, we reversed the judgment of conviction on the CFAA, CFAA count. So now Gil's a free man. Once out of prison, provisionally, and pending the results of a government appeal, Gil has to manage with all the media attention he has now. Reporters mob the door of his mom's house where he goes back to living. Uh, he'll remain under home confinement there for a few months. Uh, photographers angled for a photo of the cannibal cop. Everyone knew exactly what turned Gil Valley on. 99.9% .9 of them found it disgusting. Under the terms of a supervised release, Valley is banned from viewing online porn of any kind. He's barred from using a smartphone. Can't go into Manhattan without permission, since that's where he was supposed to have done surveillance on his victims. Had no visitation rights with his daughter. Has to get a job. The last requirement proved, proves to be almost impossible. Gill applies to dozens of jobs for which he felt he was overqualified. At least 15 were, uh, were administrative assistant positions. Never gets a call back. Told his supervisor that his Google footprint made the job search impossible, but the only recourse was a two-week workshop for ex-convicts where sometimes criminals are taught to write resumes, uh, what to wear in interviews. These are not his problems, though. 
Uh, he tries to date again, writing a post on Match.com. He writes, I'm spending my energy rebounding from the errors I made in my past and rebuilding my life. I'm hoping to find a non-judgmental woman. Non-judgmental woman. You know, a lady who's cool with uh, him posting his pictures of uh, her on cannibalism forums and talking about how badly he wants to slit her throat, eat her and shit. Tabloids find his dating profile, mock it, especially for the fact that his photo was taken on the fucking courthouse steps moments after he's released from prison. Come on, Gail. That's pretty dumb. Tabloids also mock his decision to put in his profile that he loves to cook. Dude, buddy, you're putting the ball on the tee. Of course, they're going to swing. Other things from Gil's profile are just normal dude stuff. You know, he has a dog. He uh, follows Maryland football. He watches Jeopardy, plays basketball, drinks bourbon, goes on uh, road trips. That won't stop the media from trying to make it uh, all into a good story. Uh, took five post staffers to report uh, the non-story of his dating profile. At least one uh, ambushes Valley at his home in Queens for comment. The Daily News parrots the post in both the useless information and the sneering tone, saying Valley is trying to find the perfect recipe for romance. New York Magazine uh, writes, he's hungry for love. Uh, as you can imagine, the puns are endless. Finally, in January 2021, a new newsworthy cannibal takes some of the cannibal heat off a of gill. I forgot about this. Actor Army Hammer, guy who played the Lone Ranger in that 2013 movie alongside Johnny Depp, amongst many other uh, big roles. Uh, early 2021, Army Hammer uh, found himself, what, he has a fucking weird name, by the way, found himself in the midst of a major controversy after a woman who said she had an intimate relationship with him created an account on Instagram to share gruesome details of the bizarre sexual interaction she says they used to have. The woman shared screenshots of explicit conversations that allegedly occurred between Hammer and multiple women via Instagram DMs. The alleged conversation included talk of rape fantasies, the desire to inflict pain on partners, uh, one in which the actor reportedly said he was 100% a cannibal. One of the messages allegedly from Hammer said, you live to obey and be my slave. If I want to, cut off one of your toes so I can keep it with me in my pocket so I have a piece of you in my possession. <laughs> Jesus. Hammer denied these messages were legitimate, but an ex-girlfriend then came forward and spoke to page six uh, and seem seemingly confir confirming some of the allegations. Uh, Courtney Vukov Vukovic, a woman who dated ha Hammer for a couple months, said that Hammer said he wanted to barbecue and eat her. Gil had some stuff to say about this. He said, Army can carry the cannibal fetish mantle now. Also said he couldn't help but relate. Tell the New York Post, in general, people in all walks of life have unusual fantasies that they'd never want to have made public. Just because you're a cop or an actor doesn't mean you're immune from being aroused by something that isn't as mainstream as other stuff. Gil is now 38. Uh, these days, he's been spending a lot of time uh, with my dad. Maybe. I think. I think. I don't know that for a fact, but I do know that I don't know where Gil has been most of the time. And I certainly don't know where my dad's up to, where he is. So it seems like they're probably swapping lady meat recipes. I mean, I think that's a logical conclusion. With everything else that my dad has likely done, the pieces seem to fit. Uh, also, these days, trying to make his living uh, writing books is what Gil has been up to. His first extreme horror novel, A Gathering of Evil, was published January 4th, 2018 by Red Room Press. Published a couple of other uh, novels since then. This is a description of A Gathering of Evil. Sarah McConnell and Je actually I feel like I should play the, the bear music behind it Sarah McConnell and Jennifer Miller are two young attractive New Yorkers leading seemingly normal lives unbeknownst to them they've been targeted by Bear Evil Incorporated or a group of wealthy and violent sadists who meet through the dark web and share some rather unusual and deviant sexual desires along with a desire to turn those twisted fantasies into reality Marilyn and Bruce, the wealthy couple from upstate New York who have organized the event, have gathered this group of people from all different backgrounds and brought them together through a common bond. The lust and desire to kidnap a young woman and brutally end her life. The hunt is on. Will the prey survive this gathering of evil? Published by Bear Evil Incorporated. Uh, okay. Well, they say to write what you know. Right about what you know. Gil knows a lot about desiring to kidnap young women and brutally end their lives. I can only imagine what he is uh, fantasizing about now, what he's jerking off to. Uh, Gil also makes appearances at true crime conferences. He was a panelist at 2019's Crime Con held in New Orleans. At the 2019 Crime Con, uh, Valley appeared in a standing room only panel where he expressed his regret over previous actions and fantasies, saying it ruined his life. Also said, feels like he did not deserve to be sent to prison for a fantasy that he never planned on acting upon. And with that, Gil's story comes to a close. We'll have to see how things play out from here. Obviously, hopefully, uh, it doesn't end up with charges of kidnapping, torture, rape, and murder. Let's recap this all now. 
Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Gill Valley, the Cannibal Cop. Some closing thoughts. Uh, but first, just one more sponsor here uh, before we uh, end this out. Uh, an even older one than Kroll's Cafe. One that only makes sense because this episode you know, comes out on Halloween. I'm a little irritated because the sponsor still owes us money for like the past five commercials. And I doubt I'll get paid for, for this one, you know, either. But nevertheless, today's Time Suck is also brought to you by Woody's Paranormal Rape Repellent. Hey guys, it's me again, Woody. Happy Halloween. I'm sober again, uh, three hours as of right now, and I'm back to my original product. The one that put me on a Time's Up map. You got any spooky spirits poking around your pooper? Sick of sexually excited entities hanging around your hoo-ha? Well, worry no more. All you need to get those ghosts to stop pushing and poking on your fun bits is a can of Woody's Paranormal Rape Repellent. Spray it on your bottom. Spray it on your front bottom. Spray it anywhere else. Some spectral sperm cannons trying to dump demon babies on. Our special blend of garlic, paprika, holy water, wasabi, icy hot, sea salt, green tea, sulfuric acid, and graham cracker crumbs will turn your private parts into a spook slaughterhouse. Whee! Oh, but seriously, please buy it. <laughs> Charles Guppman, my former handler and longtime associate, has gotten us into a real pickle. He took out a $5 million loan from a lending subsidiary of Bear Evil Incorporated. And so far, we've only paid back um, $23. And he put me up as collateral since I'm technically just a puppet, not a quote, living, sentient being. And the deadline to pay off the loan is New Year's Eve. Time's running out. And now I keep getting photos of wood chippers emailed to me from various bare evil executives. I know what that means. Please don't let them mulch me. What the fuck's happened with our sponsors today? And with Bear, it feels like the suck first matrix is just kind of collapsing in on itself. Uh, may Nimrod protect Woody. Uh, and it's all from Bear Evil. If time suck disintegrates, we'll know why. Okay, now for those Gill Valley cannibal cop closing thoughts. Do you think he should have been prosecuted? It's something that still divides people. Did Gill Valley's writings online prove that it was just a matter of time until he made his fantasies a reality, or was he just expressing fantasies? Something many of us do. Would criminalizing being into weird shit have serious repercussions for our society? I know my search history is full of things that might make me seem like a future serial killer, uh, to any investigators that come looking, thanks to all the weird shit I've researched. Uh, whatever the case, it seems that, at least for the time being, the legality around Gil Valley's actions have been put to rest. I'll have to see if anything else comes up in the future. If women around him start to disappear. For me, I just want to make sure that uh, we don't put anybody in prison for thought crimes, right? Do I, do I think that Gil should be in prison? <sighs> I'm not 100% sure. If, if he would have never abused his position as a cop to locate someone's address, right? The address of someone he was writing about kidnapping and killing. If he would have never surveilled someone he was writing about kidnapping and killing, then I would not think he should be arrested. But he did surveil women. He did post their actual pictures online. If he didn't cross a line there, holy shit, that he tiptoed right up to the very edge of that line. Had he went out and bought anything related to his kidnapping fantasy, like some chloroform, then I think when you add that to everything else he did, he should have for sure been sent to prison. That would demonstrate how he took what I would consider to be a substantial step towards committing a serious real world crime. But without that, I guess I would have to say I'm leaning towards being glad he was freed. I would worry about the precedent set if he wasn't. I would worry about the slippery slope of other arrests that could lead to. We should have the right to have any fantasies we want, no matter how fucked up they are. Fantasy is not a crime. No more than doing something, uh, you know, fucked up in in a video game should be a crime. How many people have done horrible things as a video game character? I doubt anyone's advocating arresting people for doing that. It's, it's obvious fantasy. With Gil, the this is just fantasy argument, you know, not so obvious, but it's still an argument that can rightfully be made. No thought crimes. Let's not have thought crimes. That's valuing safety too much above freedom for me. Uh, however, on a non-legal level, man, I sure think that Gil is a sick fuck. I think he's a creep. Was he born with the predisposition towards a dark fetish? Yeah, I think he probably was. But did he have to feed that fetish? Did he have to uh, feed it uh, to the point he found cannibal porn? And then did he have to double down only on cannibal fantasies from that point forward? No, he did it. You don't have to constantly indulge your darkest fantasies, right? Like he did. Just like you don't have to eat your favorite junk food all the time. I love donuts. Fucking love them. If I put on 300 pounds by choosing to eat mostly donuts over the next five years, should anyone feel sorry for me if I then get diabetes? If I die from being morbidly obese? No, right? Some people don't have a sweet tooth. 
I do. I think I was born with one. Does that mean I just can't help eating sugar and should not be responsible for how much sugar I eat? No, I should try and control it if I want to be someone healthy. I should I should work harder than someone who doesn't have a sweet tooth to try and control it if I want to be healthy. Gil should have worked harder, should have found a therapist, worked on figuring out how to merge his sexual fantasy life into an actual healthy sex life, a real one. Uh, that's a choice he could have made, but he did not make that choice ever. Just kept fucking beating off night after night to disturbing shit to rape, torture, kidnapping, murder. What if he would have sought out a therapist in college, really worked on, again, having a healthy sex life full of attainable fantasies, learn how to talk to girls, right? What if he had learned to do some role-playing, healthy role-playing involving, all right, cannibalism, instead of talking to fellow loners online, fucking creeps, you know, uh, registered sex offenders about, you know, cooking and his wife, slitting her throat, raping her. Had he put that work in, I think he probably could have avoided all of this. Had a good sex life. Be a pretty fulfilled person. Or who the fuck knows, maybe he was just born a psycho and just truly just, you know, born wanting to kill women. Only Gil knows, but I think he could have figured it out. I I do feel bad for him in one way. Do any of us want our most secret sexual fantasies broadcast as publicly as as his were? Not many of us. Ah, let's recap. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Gil Valley found guilty of conspiracy to commit a kidnapping, March of 2013. But then that decision reversed by a federal court in 2014. The reversal said that the prosecution wasn't able to prove that Gil was planning on a kidnapping, only that he talked about it online. The reversal basically affirmed Gil's claim that he had only ever fantasized about cannibalism and never actually intended on carrying anything out. When he was first convicted, he said he was guilty of a thought crime, prosecutors uh, prosecuting someone for beliefs, not actions. While the legality of the case is pretty definitively decided, There are still those that wonder if Gill should, in fact, have been prosecuted because he represented a threat to society. But Park Dietz said that Gill did not show any any red flags for uh, psychopathy. Psychopathy. There we go. Uh, He was basically a nice, normal guy. Aside from, you know, very dark fantasies. Number two, humans have a long and bizarre history with cannibalism. From ancient times till pretty recently, there have been cultures all over the world that have practiced some form of cannibalism, whether in rituals as means of absorbing an enemy's power and war, uh, as a sign of respect to the dead, as a medicine, or even as a culinary luxury. With modernization, most places in the world now consider cannibalism a strong taboo. But as we saw with Gill Valley, there's still places on the internet where people can connect over their love of devouring human flesh or at least fantasizing about doing so. Number three, the things that Gill, along with Moody Blues and his other co-conspirators talked about on DFN and in emails are truly horrific. They discuss eating girl meat, trying to cook a victim as slowly as possible, describing how tasty a woman would look with her legs bent up in an oven. I even seem to talk about women in real time as when Gil saw these women in real life and then went online to talk about how delicious they looked. Number four, 43-year-old German manager Bernd Brandis died how he wanted to die, eating his own dick. That's a real thing that happened. Number five, new info, there's something called involuntary auto cannibalism. Yeah, involuntary auto cannibalism. Almost every human being alive today practices or has practiced this form of cannibalism. Eating dead uh, skin cells, biting fingernails, anything like that, all considered involuntary auto cannibalism. You nail biting cannibalistic fucks. Uh, There's also a more sinister form of auto cannibalism. This is known as voluntary auto cannibalism and involves biting off muscles and eating them all together for body modification purposes. Some people also drink their own blood, auto vampirism. Clinical psychologist Richard Knoll introduced this term as a symptom of Reinfeld syndrome, naming it after the mental patient who assisted Dracula in Bram Stoker's uh, Dracula. Uh, the habit of drinking one's own blood usually begins during childhood, most commonly as a result of a traumatic event that results in a person linking pleasure with violence and more specifically blood. Eventually, autovampirism generally develops into clinical vampirism. It is, however, not recognized in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And it is extremely rare, thank God. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The cannibal cop has been sucked. This is was to me one of the most interesting episodes we've done in I don't know months, if not a year or more. I uh, wonder how much you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you as always to everyone involved, starting with the Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Gonna roast her after the show, or not? Or I don't think about that. Uh, thanks to. Uh, Thanks to the Suck Ranger producing today. 
uh, for directing uh, as well. And the Suck Ranger also helping with uh, uh, socials, cutting clips, doing a variety of things behind the scenes. Thanks to Bit Elixir for upkeep on the Time Suck app, the Art Warlock Logan Keith creating the merch of Bad Magic. Dot com, helping run our socials along with the Suck Ranger, Tyler C., and a team managed by social media strategist Ryan Handelsman. Thanks to producer Sophie Evans with her initial research this week. Uh, thanks to the All Seen Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook group, the Mod Squad, for making sure Discord keeps running smooth, and everyone over on the Time Suck subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. Next week on Time Suck, we're going to cover a voted in topic as decided by our Patreon supporting Space Lizards. The murders of Native American women and girls on and off reservations and their disappearances. Indigenous women and girls living on reservations are murdered at a rate 10 times higher than other ethnicities. According to the CDC, murder is the third leading cause of death for indigenous women. The majority of indigenous women and men experience violence in their lifetimes. Over half of indigenous women experience sexual violence in their lifetimes. What the fuck is going on? Indigenous women and girls are disappearing at an alarming rate. Many of these women and girls, victims of kidnapping, sex trafficking, murder. Why is this happening? There's no single answer. Rather, the MMIW crisis is a buildup of issues from European colonization to today. From the time of Columbus to today, laws have been uh, enacted that allow violence towards indigenous people to continue. Although there have been changes in the right direction in recent years, the crisis continues. Although it may seem like the disappearance and murders of indigenous people is a problem isolated to reservations, that is not true. In fact, the majority of indigenous people in the U.S. live off of tribal land. All right, this crisis widespread throughout major cities in the U.S. How did early colonization of North America set the foundations for this crisis? What are some of the first documented cases of missing and murdered indigenous women? How has the U.S. government com- contributed to the crisis with federal laws? What role does the media play in all this? In uh, next week's episode, we'll discuss the alarming uh, stats on missing and murdered indigenous people, reasons why so few people know just how pervasive this issue is. I certainly uh, know almost nothing about it. The origins of the crisis and laws that have helped and hurt indigenous people. All that and more on another informative episode of Time Suck, which will be next week. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. First update, nice message from the loving lady of a longtime sucker who probably doesn't beat off to thoughts of cooking and eating her, but I don't know for sure. Ashley Ray writes, hi, Master Sucker. This is Ashley Ray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you gave me the pronunciation guy. Thank you. Colby Ray's wife, just trying to get him the best birthday present I can. I know a lot of people make a bunch of clever nicknames at the beginning to get your attention. I'm just not that creative. It's almost midnight and this, this will not be my only email. Writing to ask you to wish a big happy birthday to one of your biggest fans, Colby Ray. Colby's been a fan of yours since the very beginning of Time Suck. I know. I do remember his uh, name and, yep, I've uh, talked to him before. He listens to your comedy every morning to start his day throughout the day while he's on shift as a police officer. He listens to uh, every Monday show when it drops here in Texas, every single Space Lizard episode. He even falls asleep to your podcast throughout the night. Uh, trust me, I just woke up to your bell gun as, oof, the hangy Uh Colby and I just got married in February. Bought our first house a new used car, congrats, and brought home another fur child. Uh, this year, despite never wanting kids myself, he's always been the best partner and most amazing man. Colby birthday is 1121. It would be amazing if the man who brought you your Irish accent prey as a gift in 2016 could receive a gift of his own straight from his favorite person to fill his ear holes and heart. We're going to come see you in Austin on the 5th. All the best wishes from another loyal sucker, Ashy Ray. P.S. This is not my last email. Sorry in advance for my persistence. This man of mine's worth waking up in the middle of the night to your antics on the podcast and so many emails. Until the next email, have a good one. Well, thank you very much, Ashley. That is so nice. And I, uh, uh, Colby, man, happy, happy birthday, dude. Um, young, young guy. Thank you for the spray. I do remember that. And yeah, I recognize your name. Of course, you have been along this ride from the very beginning. And I appreciate you sticking with it and, and not hating it yet. So that's, so that's good. Look forward to uh, the show in Austin, looking out and, and seeing your lovely faces. And again, happy birthday. And you got a, you got a great wife or is it, uh, is it engaged in, in fiance? No, married. Okay, good. Good. I was right with wife. Uh, next up, appreciative super sucker, William Wagner, sending a subject line of, please help me understand why my hemorrhoid cream doesn't taste as advertised. <laughs> I had to read it after that. And it was better than I hoped it would be. He writes, greetings, suck master Cummins. Praise be to Bojangles. Hail Lucifina. Glory be to Triple M. Sorry for the eye-catching subject. That's a topic for another time. Hopefully it worked out. It did. I'm going to try and keep this short, but there's uh, a lot. So I've condensed as much as I can. Want you to know that you're my fucking hero. Going back in time. That's nice. I've been a time sucker for about two years now, but listened to your stand-up well before that. 
I was never someone who listened to podcasts, but you popped my now voracious cherry. Around that time, I was going through a rough breakup with a manipulative, toxic piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. also detail, uh, dealing with the stress of transitioning back into the civilian world after spending my entire adult life in the army up until that point. With very little direction or idea what I was going to do with my life, I fell into a very dark place. It was all too familiar to me from the past. Don't worry, it sets a happy ending. But not the kind you'd find in a massage pro. Uh, there were two things that I genuinely believe saved my life. The first of which was your content and time stack. I mean, that's, I'm honored, truly. Listening to your podcast and stand up constantly kept me laughing even when I felt like I had no dr- direction in life and was dealing with the aftermath of a toxic manipulator who enjoyed watching me suffer. Man, those people are real how fucked up. Uh, while they would pretend to be the victim of everything around them, even myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Uh, I cannot stress enough how destructive these predators can be, but you kept me smiling and hearing similar stories like this from other time suckers who you also helped left feeling... Uh, left me feeling like things might be okay. And that's uh, why I like to read these messages. Second person to have been there to help was my now amazing fiance, Marissa. She is seriously the greatest person in the fucking world. (laughs) And she came into my life around the same time. She saw so much of me, even when it would have been easier for her at the time to think I was going nowhere. She inspired me to strive for greatness and encouraged me to find something I enjoy and can succeed in. Did I mention that she's easily the nicest and most supportive person in the entire fucking world? I'm sure a lot of people think that they met their own version of the best person in the world, but f- <laughs> but fuck them. I found that person. If nothing else, this is a shout out to her as well. Fast forward to the present. We live in Detroit, Michigan together. My life is a complete 180. I've worked extremely hard to build a life I can be proud of. I listen to all bad magic content religiously. Monday's the best day of the week for me. Marissa bought us tickets to see your show in Grand Rapids at the listening room for my birthday, which was surprising because until recently, she did not have a taste for your comedy. <laughs> that's fair don't hold it against her now uh she loves your content even though she barely admits it we made the trek which turned into four hours so we could stop by to see her family along the way this detail is important i swear that day i proposed to her with her family around and it was the greatest feeling in the world when she said yes i this is so fucking sweet and then three hours later we were at your show where you took the first five minutes of your show to bash the venue that was hosting you and it was the greatest thing ever seriously fuck the movie theater next door Seeing you at the show with my now fiance sitting next to me led to a huge flood of emotions that I was not expecting or prepared for. The two people in the world who I felt saved my life were in the same room together with me. You can't begin to describe how one feels in that circumstance, or maybe you can. You seem relatively smart. The show was amazing. Three out of five stars. I wanted to badly walk up to you at the end to thank you for everything, even if I didn't have an explanation, but it was an early show and I know you were busy, so I understand completely. Yeah, they had a quick turnaround on that room. Uh, I wanted to let you know this way instead which is probably better because there's full context. Whether you are included or not in the show, I just want you to know how much good you're uh, doing for a lot of people. That's so nice. Thanks for everything you do. Please don't ever change. Hail the great suck nasty supreme. Your loyal space is at will. Man, I'm so happy for you. And congrats on getting engaged uh, to Marissa. You know what? It's funny. I'm I'm never upset when somebody says like, yeah, they, they don't really like your content. I I'm amazed that we have enough people who do like it to keep this going. <laughs> Like late last night when I'm like coming up with these stupid things, I'm like, this is like, I have moments where I'm like, oh, this is really funny. And I have other moments where I just picture people listening to this and like, this is disturbing. All, this whole catalog is disturbing. What are, what are any of us doing? But, uh, but then I get messages like this and I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. All right. I am crazy, but there's other people who are the same kind of crazy and also good people and it works out. And I'm, yeah, I'm so glad that man, that you found that great person. Yeah. Toxic people. It's sometimes it's so hard to know that they are toxic. Why Someone who's really good at manipulation, they can fucking destroy lives. There is someone I'm thinking of right now, and I won't say their name, but uh, somebody, ah, I don't, I don't even want to give details, but uh, a person I've been, I was friends with, uh, hope to stay friends with, but the person they're with, to me, is so obviously so bad, such a bad person, so toxic, so manipulative, and it's, it's like watching and not just me, me and many other people watching. The, it's like it's like they're seeing them tied to the tracks, and the train is coming, and it's gonna. And they just don't realize it. They're smiling, they're like, "No, I'm having a good time tied on these tracks." No, it's great. No, I know they tied me, but it was for my own benefit. And you're like, "No, they're destroying you." So I'm so glad you got out of that. So so glad, and so glad you got with somebody who's so supportive. I am also lucky to be with who I consider the best person in the world. Lindsay is the most supportive, sweetest person. And uh, would not be where I am without that energy around me. It's so important. And before my allergies kick in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. Thank you, Will. Uh, now for a quick shout out from a sweet sack, hoping for some uh, shit to show up in her life. Hannah Dye explains. Hey, meat sack. My name is Hannah Dye. Uh, I was just married to my wonderful husband, Tony, last week. All these marriages and engagements. He was the one who got me into your podcast. Congrats. Which are horrifically beautiful. 
I think that's a good phrasing and hilarious in every way. Thank you. I figure with my new last name falling in perfectly with your podcast. Yeah, die. I figured I'd shoot my shot. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to do a shout out for my husband, Tony. Tony Die. Pretty sure he would shit his... Tony Die sounds like an, exe- an executive at Bear Pharmaceuticals. Tony Die, CEO and president, Tony Die. Wants to kill everyone you love and fucking sell their bodies to darkfetishnetwork.com subscribers. Um, but anyway, uh, pretty sure he would shit his pants if you actually read this. Well, I fucking hope he did then. Totally get it if this is not your thing, but I've got to try, especially for the person who is most likely to murder me. What? Oh, yeah, statistically. Uh, thanks for making things interesting. Hannah Die. Oh, Hannah, uh, happy for you. Tony, definitely shouting you out. Congrats again on uh, this, what did it say? Recent marriage? Yep, recent marriage. Hope you two are uh, having so much fun. Don't don't kill Hannah. She seems like a good one. Don't cook her up. Don't fucking eat her. I guess maybe jerk off to that stuff, but not too much. And now we're going to end on something much heavier. Uh, get ready. Find St. Louis Sack, kick-ass shaper of young minds, who has asked her name to be redacted for reasons that we, you know, I think are clear. Sends us a message with a lot of pollen uh, sprinkled onto it. Uh, an important message. And they write, Greetings, Suckmaster, Hail Nimrod and Lucifina, praise Bojangles, glory be to Triple M. I'm writing to ask for a shout out and I vehemently do not apologize for how long this email will be. I'm writing this while laying in bed in the dark at 10 a.m. on Tuesday morning when I should be in my classroom teaching high school kids about health. I'm going to have to like zone out as I read this to keep my shit together. Uh, Yesterday, a cowardly piece of shit walked into Central Visual and Performing Arts High School, CVPA in St. Louis, and murdered two people and wounded six more. Fortunately, the police response was rapid and decisive, and I hope that asshole died slowly and painfully. I teach at another high school in the St. Louis Public School District that is a mile away from CVPA, and our school was the site they brought the survivors of this nightmare to for their parents to come pick them up. Well, except for one 16-year-old girl, Alexandria Bell, that the affirmation piece of shit murdered. The teacher who was killed was a friend of mine. Not a close friend, just someone I saw during district-wide professional development. But we hung out in the same group of health and PE teachers and would all go to lunch together on those days. She was cool, funny. I could tell she was a great teacher. Apparently, when the gunman entered her room, she got between him and her students, unsurprisingly having known her over the past 13 years, and it was the last thing she'll ever do. Her name is Jean Kuska, and she's a fucking hero. As teachers, we all tell ourselves it'll never happen at my school. I was fortunate that it wasn't my school, but me and my students were standing at the windows, watching the dozens of first responder vehicles fly down the road and the helicopters hovering over the scene and the buses filled with kids, many of whom have friends and family at my school, who had just had to flee their own school, arms raised as they exited the building so the police knew not to shoot them, and at least one who told one of our staff who had to step over a body as he fled. There are many more people more immediately affected by this than me. I'm a little fucked up by it all, so I can only imagine what they're going through. But I want the world to know Jean Kuska is a rock star. She deserves to be honored and remembered. When police, firefighters, or soldiers die in the line of duty, people line the streets for their funeral procession. We're not technically supposed to die while teaching, and if anyone deserves that honor, it's Jean. I will be there and invite all of my St. Louis area cult fam to join in. Thank you for letting me work through my grief this way. Thanks to you and the entire Bad Magic family for all you do for us. Uh, if these allergies I've suddenly got ever clear up, I'm going to go back to my classroom. I'm going to try a little harder to make a difference in honor of Jean. Her family's requesting donations be made in her honor to JDRF.org. JDRF is a leading global organization harnessing the power of research, advocacy, and uh, whew, community engagement to advance life-changing breakthroughs for type 1 diabetes. She was big into cycling, was a huge advocate for a local annual cycling fundraiser for JDRF. One of her kids has had T1D uh, since a young age, and this cause was near and dear to her heart. Thanks. And again, so uh, yeah, if you want to make a donation in her honor, jdrf.org. Oh, man. And that is, uh, again, that is uh, hero teacher Jean Kuska sacrificed herself to save students. And uh, one of the students, unfortunately, that was killed, Alexandria Bell. So rest in peace, both you. I um, mean, Nimrod, uh, take care of you up there. And man, thanks for sending that message. Yeah, there's some fucking heroes out there. And they're, uh, sometimes they're teachers. And not all the teachers that, you know, like uh, get killed in, uh, well, te- which is such a fucking crazy thing that that's uh, not common, but not as uncommon as it should be. And uh, yeah, man, shaping young minds. What a, what a, what a fucking noble profession. So much respect for that. And Gene sounds like one of the best teachers you could possibly ever want. So thanks for sending that in. Again, anonymous St. Louis teacher. And yeah, go uh, go honor her by by doing the best teaching you, you possibly can. Thanks, everybody. Next time, suckers. I needed that. 
We all did. So thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Uh, maybe stop jerking off to elaborate fantasies involving kidnapping, hog tying, raping, cooking, eating women, you know. There's a lot of other things to jerk off to. At least, I don't know, at least try cartoon ladies being kidnapped, hog tied, raped, cooked, and eaten. I mean, still pretty fucked up, but a stroke in the right direction, I think. Or maybe beat it to thought of just continuing to keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Please, guys, I'm, I'm serious. I really need some money. I mean, I owe millions of dollars. I, I, I don't know if I can sell enough paranormal or rape repellent. I just, I'm uh, Charles, he fucked up so bad. And I'm so scared. But don't let me be chipped. I'm paid, I've, I've, I've got to go for me, campaign. Don't chip Woody, just search for don't chip Woody, go for me, knock out. Oh, God. And then you can send, you can send bottles of Mad Dog, fortified wine. I'm gonna, I can't say it's over without this stress. You can find it on my GoFundMe page. Please, please, don't let me, don't let me be chipped. Please. Steak, fuck that piece of shit. We bury me a 